Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> We're here today, uh, September 21st, 2020, uh, for the, a business workshop. And the time is 1.02 p.m. Uh, on our workshop agenda today, we have agenda review for the September 22nd, 2020 regular agenda, and that's scheduled for one hour, 60 minutes. And second on the agenda is protocol and process review to include onboarding process, and that's 120 minutes. So at this time, we will begin with the agenda review, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Atkins. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just to go on through the agenda review, the first uh, item that we received questions on was uh, item E6 on the consent agenda, academic services. The uh, question relates to uh, helping teachers and just a request for more information. Does he or she travel among schools? Uh, what are the duties of non -field, on non-field trip days? And um, what is the policy in general for field trips this year? So we have academic services. I know uh, Lee Hughes and uh, Candace Alvedo will be here, here, Lee already here. So, um, who, who, by the way, you had the Star Watch blown up. I don't know if you know what that is, but it's almost like a planetarium. If you've got a chance to see it, it's really neat. He had it down in the center atrium earlier uh, today, so I got nosy and had to go in and check it out. <laughs> so, it, but if you haven't seen that, you ought to see it at some time. It's yeah, pretty we're, cool. We're, we're training some staff on delivering Star Labs, so we can make sure it's safely and securely, you know, facilitated with our schools and our students. It's um, very, it's very, very cool. And he provides assistance if you sit on the floor and you need help getting up. <laughs> <laughs> Right. And I just wanted to mention that Mrs. Morgan will be calling in for this workshop. Okay. Thank you. Um, certainly under normal conditions, environmental education, helping teachers go out to the school, they pick up students and teachers, and then that is a facilitated field trip. Um, we are currently on hiatus with our field trips. We're providing push-in and school level support, much like our mosquito education program is providing. So they are going out to schools to deliver some presentations, but they're doing so with social distancing and safe precautions. Um, this particular program and partnership is with the Lee County Solid Waste Division, and so it's a resource recovery field trip. Last year, before COVID transitioned us to distance learning, we had 21 schools and 2,000 students participate in the program. Um, this year, we're planning to present that program in person or digitally through Zoom or other you know, online platforms so students still get the same type of recycling program. Um, it just be delivered through a different means and we're giving schools the choice of that either in-person presentation or the online presentation. Um, the other question I believe was about on non-field trip days, what does that employee do? Well, helping teachers assist with other environmental education activities. Um, they're cross-trained on all of the field trips, so in the event we need coverage or someone calls out sick, there's availability for people to go on those other field trips when we're offering field trips. Um, because we've had to pivot and provide much of the, that programming either digitally or through virtual field trips, um, employees are also working to develop those virtual types of field trips. The other thing is our helping teachers are engaged with our community partners and our colleagues across the district, so they help facilitate communication, answer the phone, and then also prepare activities and resources for upcoming trips. So, and board members, just on another note, I mean, if you have not had an opportunity to, to do one of these trips, like whether you've been out to the, uh, the recycling facility or uh, been through the swamp or something like that, there, I think we're extremely lucky to be living in Southwest Florida in this environmentally um, rich environment that we find ourselves in. And so the, and to see, this uh, solid waste facility and what they're doing out there, that's state of the art. Um, they don't do that around the country. A lot of places use these huge landfills and, and we do not. So I think it's really a, a unique opportunity for our kids to be able to get out there. I wish we could do more of these, quite honestly. Yeah, and if I may add too, um, Lee County Solid Waste is giving our helping teacher access to their security cameras on campus. And so that allows for 
her to create a presentation, deliver that presentation, and then portal in using their cameras and show the recycling process in action. Um, that is unique, and that's pretty incredible that we have access to their, their technology and their computers, but it certainly doesn't replace the authentic, hands-on types of field trip that we like to be able to offer, but we know it's just not safe to do that right now. Ms. Vaughn, did you have a question? Yeah, that, that was my question, and I just really hadn't heard of it before and just wanted a little general in background information. It's, it's great when we can have our community partners do things like this, but yeah, we, I, I was just curious because, especially about the field trip thing, because it was my understanding that we just aren't gonna be really doing field trips this year. So I wondered how that part was gonna work. Environmental education has a 30 year history here in Lee County. Um, it used to be its own department with a you know, larger number of staff. Um, we currently have one helping teacher that's district funded, one helping teacher that is grant funded. This reestablishes a partnership with Lee County Solid Waste. So it's giving us another resource for helping teacher. Um, traditionally, we provide field trips during the school year. It used to be every school in the district got a field trip. And as Dr. Atkins said, there's trips to the beach to explore the mudflats. There's trips to Six Mile Cypress Slough to go, you know, trudging through the swamp. Um, we also do a lot of work with our community partners. So this is um, a unique experience that reinforces a partnership with Lee Solid Waste, but also highlights their efforts to not have a, leaf, a landfill here in Lee County and provide some programming that goes beyond the classroom. Yeah, I, th I think it's a good program. I just need it to be edified about it. Sure, excellent, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, next um, item, board members, uh, human resources, approval of personnel recommendations, uh, question related to certified personnel um, appointments. Please explain these positions that report to the following locations as, expo as opposed to school sites, uh, health services, academic services, student welfare and attendance and were these advertised positions that teachers applied for? Uh, Dr. Pruitt. Yeah, um, good afternoon, everyone. So currently in health services, we have the school nurse position, and in academic services, the athletic trainer position, and student welfare and attendance are the school social workers. Those are all part of the instructional bargaining unit and the normal um, hiring and advertising and hiring the Lee County way applies. Was there another question you had related to that or? Oh, okay, so it was, at, these are advertised if, if particular people wanna want to do that and they retain um, TALP teacher status. Correct. They just, instead of going to their school site, they're actually here like in, this, correct. in this building reporting. Right. That's yes. correct. Uh, okay, well. Yeah, I just wasn't sure as, as a teacher what additional role they e would. Each of these positions are um, have a, their own job description. Right. Um, and for example, with the school nurse, that was something, you know, that's not, not, in every district, the school nurses aren't necessarily part of their teacher bargaining unit, but in Lee County, they are part of it. Same thing with the school um, social worker separate job description, different credentials, um, but they are part of the bargaining unit. Okay, yeah, and I didn't look up the job description. So do they become um, whatever, 214 days or whatever, do they become? Uh, I believe there's a couple different, um, the jobs allow for several different um, and so it, I think it just depends on the particular situation. And then, um, you know, they, the person who oversees those areas helps to determine, like Beth Whiff does the assignments for the school nurses, because we don't have, um, I think we have currently 38 school nurses, so, you know, you can tell there's not one for every school. <laughs> so that's why they're deployed from the district office, and she sets the schedule. Okay, but they're... They stay on the, um, the count, correct? Yes. Okay, I, as I said, I got lazy. I didn't look up the job descriptions, but was just curious about it. Yep. Thank you. You're welcome. Looks like I was the big questioner. <laughs> <laughs> like the only no, one. <laughs>
The next item is uh, from the operations agenda. It's approval to increase the expenditure for the ITN, indoor air quality, environmental consulting, asbestos, lead abatement, microbial remediation, remodeling, and painting. Question is uh, indoor air quality expenditure increase of 1.3 million for five month period. Uh, please explain additional costs of 250,000 each. Uh, 50,000 per month for, for coil cleaning and maintenance day-to-day -day repairs. Um, Dr. Savage. Thank you. Uh, just uh, due to COVID-19, the district was proactive in performing additional coil cleaning services prior to the start of school. Uh, when coils are dirty, it makes the entire system far less efficient uh, and reduces uh, its ability to cool efficiently. Uh, this is particularly important when we have increased the level of fresh air circulation. It puts even more stress on the system efficiency, but it is a major contributor to safety. Performing the additional coil cleaning services helps to ensure that coils are as clean as possible and the HVAC system is operating at the best capacity to maximize airflow within facility spaces. It is important during this pandemic that uninterrupted and adequate airflow is continuously maintained at all district sites to minimize the spread of viruses and or contaminants within facility spaces. The need for an additional 250 will restore part of the funding that was utilized for coil cleaning services prior to the start of school. Again, these additional funds already used were unforeseen expenditures that impacted our normal day-to-day -day expenditures on the, sorry, I think I've got my, my bid next in here. It have now caused the bid to be short for normal day-to-day -day expenses. I'm sorry, sir, I think I've got the, the document that I have, I think is crossed on some of the... Um, uh, and the, do you the mind if I ask questions after each segment? There were, there were, I think, about five questions for each segment. Yeah, sir. yeah, can I we, ask? We were going to try to address, we have responses for each, each bullet point, if that works for you. So, yes. Yeah, well, um, okay, so this is for a five-month period that we're adding the additional money, right? Did I read that properly? That is correct. Uh, okay. We have already provided monies funding for coil cleaning. So what you're saying is there's gonna be more coil cleaning. Yes, due to COVID, additional coil cleaning. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay, and then also maintenance day-to-day -day repairs is also an extra 50,000 a month. What, okay, um, you see extra repairs because of COVID? I don't understand because we already have budgeted for that, but this is in addition because of COVID. So I didn't understand what additional things might be under that. The original amounts that were originally approved were the typical expenditures within the existing normal bids. Everything that's been additionally asked is specific to either additional impact via COVID or to make whole what is essentially otherwise funds that we've had to, to pay towards COVID related uh, impacts that are taking away from the routine day-to-day -day business that would otherwise have been approved in the original bid. That's that's kind of the underlying issue of this, whether we had to start ex processing expenditures against whatever procurement vehicles we had uh, and start expending to meet the need of what we were encountering with COVID, but that doesn't change the fact that we still had our typical business both in the HVAC and in the indoor air quality that is still routine work that is typically budgeted on an annual basis. But we have an additional, and I didn't question this, uh, 800,000 over the five month period already that says unforeseen COVID-19 reactive mitigation. Yes, and that is specific to some of this has already occurred in terms of the, the pinpoint type of what we've transitioned as opposed to the last board agenda item that we brought that, that kind of uh, priced out whole school fogging for a significant period of time. This is to accomplish the more precise pinpoint fogging that may occur, but again, we are trying to shift as quickly as possible to a staff-based approach where we are able to train and outfit our folks with PPE. But in the absence of being able to do that, we wanna make sure we have ample funds to be able to do the fogging as we have done. And again, we continue to receive invoices and things to that effect uh, that we just wanna make sure we have sufficient funding in our bids so that our work does not have to stop. 
um, pre uh, prematurely. But that doesn't necessarily mean that whole amount will be spent. That's, that's just what you. That's correct. We, we have every intention of returning every dollar to the district that we possibly can to try to minimize costs as well without compromising safety, of course. Okay. Um, there were there were a number of bullet and there were there, even though there were a couple of questions there were like sub questions within questions do you want me to address the specific additional pieces that maybe okay, weren't addressed so that response? this that you were just um, talking about mm -hmm. um, is this figure the eight hundred thousand dollar figure based on services being administered by the contracted vendors rather than trained staff so in other words you're that's estimating correct. that it'll take five months to train staff to do this? No, uh, that we are, we're going to try to train staff as quickly as we possibly can. If in the event that we were unable to do that or there was some unforeseen issue related to liability or some other issue, this would allow us to be able to complete the current cleaning for approximately five months. Our intention is not to do that. Our intention is to shift gears as soon as we possibly can to uh, the, a, 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 more cost-effective approach that still provides tremendous benefit, um, but at the at the at a cost point. Understanding that we may not get reimbursed for that, but that we'll be doing things in a in a way that's very defensible and um, is still prioritizing safety, but just doing it with with saving every penny that we can as well. Okay, and I appreciate that, and I you know I actually made a comment here, and I'll be quiet once I get through this question, but um, I'm a little. I'm a lot concerned that about two weeks ago, we had a much, much higher figure. And the plan was we're just going to fog every, all the schools, the whole building every week to be proactive. Mm -hmm. And then I know I questioned, well, why would a whole school need that if certain areas aren't used as much and, and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And then the next thing I know, the whole item is pulled and it's and it's reworked. And what I'm concerned about is it seemed like a couple of weeks ago there was not a definitive plan. There were there was um, it was a work in progress, in other words, which is fine. I, I think plans need to be works in progress. But I'm a little concerned when plans <clears throat> put out in front of the board before they're finalized. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering about this one just based on Ms. Stilwell's um, verbiage when she sent us an update. Our team is currently working on replacement model that will allow, and I think that's great. That's what I personally would say from the get-go. Right. Let's use our in-house mm -hmm. when, when we can instead of contract it vendors, but um, I have I'm happy to, to I have speak to, be to that honest about it. it mm -hmm. It's a big switch from a lot of money all of a sudden. And um, I never did get my good answers on the science of doing the proactive. And I think the reactive when we have cases to mitigate is a much better, more, much more cost effective plan. So I'm really glad we're doing that. But I just felt like I had to speak up and, and say that as a board member, I really much prefer, and I don't know what my colleagues feel, but I much prefer to have a definitive plan that's done and not changing figures. Absolutely. Um, well, I, I can speak to a little bit of that. We actually evaluated uh, staff our internal staff conducting the fogging uh, is, or as far back as April. Uh, and that was our original recommendation was to do something along those lines because we liked the ability to have that control, felt that that would be the most efficient application to have that on site. The challenge uh, among others is that as you started exploring whether that could ever be reimbursed, you were starting to get a lot of guidance between CARES and FEMA 
was that if your existing school staff were doing it during the course of their regular school day, that that may in fact not be something that might be reimbursable down the line. And so the proper way to demonstrate, similar as if you have a hurricane or any other type of disaster, is to show that the actions you are taking are in fact not something supplanting or replacing a typical routine function with existing staff, but in fact a very separate action that is distinct and completely related solely to the, the action of the disaster that's, that's underway. Knowing that a lot of time you get these rules and the rules change after the fact and it's very difficult sometimes to get the full reimbursement. What we attempted to do was pivot based on the best guidance that we had to ensure that we had a very clear and obvious separate expense that was entirely related to COVID and nothing else specifically to COVID that was proven by our high rates of community transmission that and, it, and supported by the medical guidance we received that by doing ongoing fogging to the extent that we were doing would demonstrate that there was a high prevalence of this COVID here in the community as long as we were doing those kinds of things whether as a response or as a preventative mitigation that it could be a reimbursable function. Now it certainly was costly. As long as it was a contractor. It, it, is, and, and they, but it had to be separate folks with their, you know, showing very clearly from an invoice standpoint and everything for, further that they in fact were for this specific COVID related task and nothing else. That said, everyone in the country is dealing with this and we understand that the, the rules can change and we don't want to be making decisions based on reimbursements. We want to be making decisions based on enhancing safety. That's our top priority. And so what we're attempting to do is to really show that and demonstrate that. Um, but that's, a, that's certainly a piece of it. So I know that was one of your questions had to do with the that's, rule of guidance. And, and <clears throat> so then to condense that quite a bit, what you're saying is that much of this is based on the fact um, analyzing uh, FEMA information that um, we had the realization that as it existed, we probably would not be reimbursed. About two weeks ago, we received some, some information that it made it appear as though it might not be reimbursable at this point. Now, again, that rules could change again, uh, as they did maybe through June. And it's, it's just one piece of it. You know, at the end of the day, what we want is the most cost effective, best safety mitigation effort. That's our priority. We're not trying to put a price tag on safety in any way. It's simply a matter of trying to be judicious. That's, that's really what it comes uh, down yeah, to. Yeah, but we might not put a price tag on safety, but... If you don't have the money, you don't have the money. That's that's so, fair. Well, that ends for that section. I don't want to. I had one other question, but I. Go ahead, Mrs. Well, Ms. Vaughn, you go ahead, and then I'll call Ms. Giovanelli, and then Ms. Oh, Kittens. you want me to finish on the last question? I'm not sure. Okay. What? All right. The last one um, had to do with the HVAC. <clears throat> um, Do you like me to hit? I have. They're really. These are pretty short responses. Yeah, this is Some a, of these doesn't. Okay. So you talked about the coils, and I mm -hmm. don't know much about air right. conditioners, but I know they have coils. So these kind of come together. Do they? Do they not? The repairs. The because um, we have money two hundred fifty thousand for the five months on coil cleaning. Mm -hmm. um, does that not? So that's in the other piece, in the air quality piece. This HVAC right. piece, we specifically addressed filters as part of the concern. Um, but, but yes, but certainly that affects, they're all. That's, that affects the air quality, yes? Absolutely. And that's why both these two are together. It's why we are able to use the fogging under these two areas as well, because it is an interrelated area, for sure. Okay. Uh, our HVAC systems are how we predominantly ensure air quality. So it, it makes sense that they go hand in hand on that. Um, I, I have the, I actually have your questions here in front of me and I can give okay. you the, they're really, these are short responses. Right. So I can read them and, then, and hopefully this will be sufficient. Sure. Um, please explain the additional cost of $450,000 for maintenance day-to-day -day repairs. Give a few examples of repairs that would be different in response to COVID. The response, uh, the additional $450,000 for maintenance day-to-day -day repairs will encompass repairs such as barred unit changeouts for district-owned portables. That's the, the units that attach to portables and repairs to chiller and air handler system components. These day-to-day -day repairs also include uh, repairs to leaky chilled water pipes. Uh, these day-to-day -day repairs are reported by facilities through our district work order system. Does the $400,000 cost of the HVAC filter replacements include the cost of installation of these filters? Yes, uh, the $400,000 estimated expenditure being requested does include the cost of the installation of the filters. The cost 
of the filter and, and the insulation. That is correct. Installation. Uh, did we change out old HVAC filters for upgrades prior to the start of the school year? Yes, the, F, the HVAC filters were upgraded prior to the start of the school year. Uh, to our MRF, MRF 13. Um, how, do the, how often do the filters need to be replaced? During the COVID-19 pandemic, AC filters need to be changed out monthly. After the COVID-19 pandemic, the district can return to quarterly filter changeouts. Why are we not using school-based maintenance staff to replace filters? The response, uh, the school-based maintenance personnel have specific job duties that they need to accomplish on a daily basis while providing assistance to staff and administrators for each site. The HVAC systems are some of the most expensive facility components and are extremely costly in the event that all routine maintenance is not followed exactly on schedule and performed correctly. Uh, this is one of the core quality control functions that our district maintenance staff provides. The staff that replace filters have the additional experience to look for HVAC performance issues while performing the routine maintenance. Uh, some of the facilities have a significant number of AC filter changeouts on site that would need to take place on a monthly basis. Uh, and the time it would take to change them all is significant. We do not want to take any chances that this isn't done on time and properly. To give you an example, like Bonita High School, one of the most recent invoices had 252 uh, uh, filter changeouts. Uh, Cypress Lake Middle, I think it was like 167, I believe. So that just gives you an example of the breadth of these pieces and also the significance that they are in fact done on schedule is very important uh, for for us to control cost and that okay so they're normally quarterly but now they're monthly that's correct uh i know during my time at astero high school um i would see our own maintenance workers pull up a ladder go up the ladder change a filter mm -hmm. uh how hard is it to change a filter i'm not talking about you you in your reply you were talking about other, I'm, I'm not expecting our maintenance people to fix problems with air, air conditioning um, in the units, but I, I can how hard is it speak. to change a filter is what I don't understand. I think two, two things. One, it dep okay. depends on the unit. Some are easier than others. Uh, but when we did have our school-based people changing the filters, we had, it was ex extremely inconsistent across the district. You know, you think about the tracking of all the filter changes and not every building supervisor was <coughs> keeping up with it. So it was leading to other issues down the line in indoor air quality. Um, so the district then dis made the decision to take that, that, that function back over and do it through the maintenance department rather than do it this method rather than do it, then count on, try to count on our building supervisors to do it. Well, I, I can personally tell you. I, don't I, I, I can tell you that if a, if a supervisor is not doing his or her job and um, that person doesn't have business being there. And besides, I, I know we have um, APs that are in charge of Right, Mr. Buchanan, when I, he was um, the assistant principal in charge of overall, um, and, and I think every school has that, don't they? Uh, I was one of them and, and had to also do it as a principal. So yes, assistant I, principal, it just, um, not right now, but I, I would like to see this kind of like how many, just you don't have to do every school, but give me, um, within the next several days, how many schools, uh, or like some of the schools, how many change outs and um, the cost of the filters? Because I imagine these um, MERV 19, MERV what, 13? 13. Mm -hmm. MERV 13 are more expensive, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. But they've got to be the same size so they wouldn't fit in the place. So. I, I'm just not, whenever we have anything that we need to have done like this in the maintenance area, um, it's, it dismays me to see how many times we contract out to vendors versus using our own. I mean, from cabinet tree, we have, I've toured that area, we have artisans in that department and we have building supervisors and assistant principals that have the duty to see that the things are done and and frankly this time i would like to see it not centralized to the district i'd like to see each school 
um, take it upon themselves. This is just my opinion as one person. So thank you. I appreciate your answering all my questions. And I am Pleasure. finally done. Thank I appreciate you, everybody's We appreciate time. that. <clears throat> Ms. Giovanelli. Thank you. Well, I just had one real question. So the, the filters. Mrs. Giovanelli, can you pull your microphone down? Oh. You. There you go. Is that any better? Yes. Oh, thank you. Sorry. Um, the filters, they're normally they're done quarterly because like I know at my home, we do them monthly. So that, so now you're doing a monthly. So I was just curious about that. And then um, I was the one of the questions is um, we do have an HVAC department, but do we just not have don't don't have enough staff to to support that endeavor? It sounds like this is kind of a larger topic that I'd be happy to go back to maintenance staff and just get a briefing, uh, just some nice material for you all to react to that gives you a little bit more comprehensive piece of what our internal staff does, what our building folks do that are there um, around this topic. If this is an area of particular interest, we're happy to provide some additional information to kind of supplement that piece of what we rely on contractors. You give you more comprehensive information so it's not just all being received verbally here like today. You, I think you'd be surprised at how, <laughs> just literally how massive this is. I mean, yes, it's certainly something that we could, we could manage internally. We have done it internally. Um, you know, is, I will tell you that I wouldn't be comfortable to do it to count on every single building because of the, some of the complexity of some of the, the buildings and making sure that that piece of equipment, it's a multi-million dollar piece of equipment, I want to make sure that that is maintained appropriately. And and I, I mean, Ms. Vaughn, I don't disagree, you know, you with the consistency, your concern, you always are talking about consistency, mm -hmm. consistency. And, and you're absolutely right, it's extremely important to be consistent with the maintenance of these HVAC systems. And I know prior to that, as a district, and this was years ago, we were very inconsistent and it caused breakdowns um, and indoor air quality issues. And that's why it did come back in house. So whatever solution that we ultimately land on, and I don't mind looking at something different than contracting it out, but it has to be something I think that guarantees the consistent maintenance of these extremely expensive pieces of hardware. No, I, I totally agree because I know sometimes I kick myself and say, oh, I need to change my filter at my, at, in my house. But um, it just seems like in this particular instance, it's just another step away from the school. And I mean, what somebody in the school needs to be because it is so expensive and we want the filters to be changed out even when there's not covid we we don't want in some of the older schools like a buildup of mold or, or whatever happens when the air conditioning's not working right but it it just seems personally i'm just i don't know what my colleagues feel on this but that it seems like it might be an issue that could be dealt with within the schools and then if there's a problem um that's when you call in the vendors or the experts but that's like when it that. comes to teacher salary i'm like spend the moon but, <laughs> but these things these these issues when we stay up with things that's when things are less likely to go wrong. It's mm -hmm. when we start um, not monitoring that it's done monthly, quarterly, whatever, mm -hmm. that's when things go awry. Right. And if there are supervisors that are not looking out for this, as I said, they might need a demotion. Anyway, I'm done talking. <laughs> Thank you. Go Sorry. ahead, continue, Mrs. Thank Giovanelli. You. So, that really, so you really didn't answer my question because we have an HVAC department, and I would think they were would be trained in changing filters. So that's that's really the question. If we, but, well, we have I, a I thought your question was whether or not we had the, the staff to do it, and I think at this time, <laughs> no, we do not. If we were to do it internally, you would want to have a staff that would reflect like that because what I, my answer to your question was it's a massive effort and, and being a massive effort <laughs> means that, that it would take a substantial amount of time for st our staff to be able to change out all of those filters and therefore 
we are we are currently contracting it out. Now I don't have any issue with looking at uh, alternative models uh, to do that, but I think it would require you know us also to look at at how our HVAC department um, is staffed. So and that leads me back to the question I asked um, at the last meeting regarding. Um, <coughs> the companies have enough staff to do it because I thought that was the that was an issue so is the staffing aspect and I never got an answer exactly <coughs> how many employees they have to to be able to um, handle such a job you know so that was one of the questions that I never got an answer to well because I don't think we know how many <coughs> employees that a private company has that we have a don't contract they have to be vetted with and through HR and everything yeah. We, we can certainly report back on the badging totals, but that doesn't necessarily indicate who, how many of those folks, I mean, it, it's certainly we could, we could do, there are some work we could do to try to give you an idea of how many approved folks we have. Uh, certainly there is some level of communication between maintenance and those vendors as they're assessing where they're working on particular sites and saying, well, how many folks do you have that can do the work? That is something that does occur at that level, but it isn't recorded as a static record to be shared that this is exactly how many they have because that could be a fluctuating <coughs> thing that could that could move what we really care about is can you do the work can you actually complete the site that you're supposed to do now we don't try to manage their companies for them you know so if they say we can take on x amount of schools and it takes them more time to do it they have to work later into the night because if you're staff then that's something that they do. That's part of why the original recommendation was on unit pricing, was to try to not have to get it to a point where it was a specific, where we're having to figure out exactly how many people they need to do every square foot per square foot. We were trying to get to a point of, here's how long, how many labor hours we know it takes to do an entire facility. And if they do it with 10 staff or 13 staff, they'll be paid the same price because we know how long it takes to do from a labor hour standpoint. Now, again, we moved away from that model to a more precision model to really go by room uh, specifically. And again, we're moving even more so to our own staff being able to do that, but we're just not at that point yet. Uh, so it's certainly not a lack of wanting to answer your questions. It's just a matter of um, just trying to make sure we are being clear with the response that, that that's that's really how we looked at it. We weren't asking them, give us a roster of your employees. It was more or less, do you have the bandwidth to do this? How many schools could you do? Uh, and there was a lot of conversation with our procurement folks and our maintenance staff to try to accomplish that effort. Uh, that did change. We moved away from that whole school because it was a tremendous bandwidth. Um, this specific one, doing with, with the HVAC filters, a little bit different. Um, and what I heard, though, was a clear interest uh, from a board standpoint. It sounds like at least a couple of the members of the board really want a clear understanding of what is it that our staff does, any in-house staff that we have related to HVACs, what is it that we specifically contract out for. Um, and so I think we'd be happy to put together some <laughs> nice information that summarizes what we do, what do our in-school staff do, uh, it would be just wonderful reading that we could bring to the board and might be a good conversation piece or future workshop uh, if, it, if you find that the information is, is, is worth, worthy of that. Uh, but we'd be happy to put something together. I'll, I can get back with maintenance and find out how long it would take for us to put something like that together in writing so that you all could have that in one of your weekly board uh, updates if that meets your approval. Right. Th thank you. Because, I mean, for me, I'm just curious because I'm just trying to understand the whole process, you know, and um, it just... It's a, it's a large contract and to keep increasing it throughout the year, I, you know, it is alarming. So that's, that's why, we, you know, especially in the times when we don't know what our budget will be, you know, the, as a result of, of COVID. So um, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm more curious. So thank you. I, I would like to see um, a quick briefing, even if it's just a, even an email telling us the process, you know, what, you know, it takes, as soon as they get done with one school, it's time to start it all over again or with all the filters, you know, and, sure. and so, you know, I just have to kind of understand it better. Thank it's you. a big operation. I mean, there's, as Dr. Atkins alluded to, it's major, but we're happy to do it to bring some clarity for it. We certainly don't ever expect you to approve of something expensive without the details you want. Right. So then and I have another question. So back on the other um, contract, the uh, indoor air quality. Um, Thank you for bringing up the, the, the FEMA and, you know, re, um, referencing the issues that, because we had that same issue with indoor air quality, the same very contract with, with 
regarding FEMA and the hurricane and, and expenditures that weren't uh, under their scope of their contract. So this, since there's no contract details, which I'm not sh sure, um, is this still gonna fall within that scope because of the contract? Or because I know um, some, some <coughs> districts have gone out to bid for the COVID cleaning and um, actually Broward pays 20 bucks, 28 bucks an hour to, um, to COVID clean um, a building. Um, so that's, that's not that ex as expensive as what this is being increased to. So that uh, is a little bit um, alarming as well. And, I, and I, my other issue is that, I, why didn't we talk about this like in April? And I, I know you mentioned that a minute ago because I think that's being proactive instead of reactive. But I know that COVID and so forth, lots of things have been changing. It's very fluid because now they know that the data is that it doesn't stay on the surface as long as they thought it did initially. So I kind of get that um, as well. Um, I just want to be careful that we don't, we're not just carte blanching indoor air quality, you know, so it's important. Um, I'd like to see a plan and schedule of how that's gonna, how we're gonna, what we're going to do going forward, um, because I asked for that last time as well. Um, I do have a question, because I was told that FMTC just pays $650 a school every time they have a cleaning. Um, so I don't understand how our, con this is different from FMTC. I'd have to research that and get back to you. You said uh, Fort Myers Technical College paid, I'm sorry, what was it? $50 a, a cleaning for Be happy school. to, we can, yeah, I'll How's get with different? pull our invoices, find out what's happening with, a, with uh, FMTC. Be happy to investigate okay. that and provide a response. Okay. That's all I have, thank you. Thank you, okay, Mrs. Gittins, before I entertain you, uh, Dr. Savage, um, shall we uh, poll the board and see if there's an interest among the majority of the members for further information and a briefing regarding the HVAC process to help with understanding? So uh, if you just indicate by thumbs up, and Mrs. Morgan, if you're with us, just give me an eye. Isn't it more than, I think there, it's more than just the HV, it's maintenance, because they're not, people are not understanding the difference of what maintenance, what our well, maintenance what do. What our building maintenance right. people yeah. do versus mm -hmm. what, what we contract yes. out for. Because sometimes with the contracts with the people who install HVAC, isn't there some kind of support? For it with that as well. Uh, it's, and we could give you a comprehensive that. information if that's a, a topic right. of interest for the entire board. And if, if the majority are interested in that, then Dr. Savage can go ahead and perform that. Ms. Patrika? Uh, I can live with it. Okay, I can live with it. Okay. We'll Thank be happy you. to do it. Thank you. Okay, and now Ms. Gittins. I just had a quick question. Um, I know that, that we have all of the supplies. We got the container loads of all the the, um, I would call it disinfectant, but the material to, to fog and all of that and to do that type of thing. And that we're now in the process of, of trying to train our employees, correct? <clears throat> uh, well, to clarify two things. One, yes, it is a disinfectant. The uh, BioEsc is a disinfectant, so that's correct. The second piece, we are in the, we are developing what that process will need to be uh, in order to train our existing staff. So figuring out what requirements have to be in place specifically for our staff to do it, um, it just hits a number of different areas. And so we just wanna make sure all those things are done so that we're doing it properly. Uh, and then we will, as soon as, and, but rapidly, uh, right. as soon as we possibly can, we will, we would like to move in that direction. That's our intention. So in the meantime, we are using outside people to do it? A response fogging as we have been doing under our uh, IAQ bid, that is correct. Okay, okay. and we are not, um, but we're not doing the daily and weekly and all that any longer. We are not doing the weekly entire site fogging, that is correct. And I guess my question is for the sake of our people, our maintenance people, a lot of the people that work in the district have more than one job. So are we going to be able to offer them this as an additional 
<clears throat> or are we going to have to say that, you know, this is a part of your job? Well, potentially, it's one of the things that gets evaluated, the role of overtime, the role of if it's something that's within their existing job description or different, that's again, factors that have to be, they're part of that process as well. Uh, so on what level, who would be trained specifically um, and, and how would that play out, uh, all has to be developed in, as part of that plan, that's correct. And, and we don't know what time that we're looking as, at? As soon as we possibly can. We really, uh, we're, we're on it already. We've had a number, we've actually consulted with a few other folks who do this work to get their opinions, to research other school districts, to try to get the best information we have and then quickly um, move within our organization to do it as well. Okay. And I think the concern of some of the, the people that have contacted me that did hear that we're not using the company or whatever, it was what is happening, you know, how are the places getting cleaned and disinfected if we're in the midst of changing one to the other. So well, that, well it's, it's very important also note that we do as a matter of our normal surface cleaning protocols, we do have existing protocols to harden us against the virus. Uh, so it's not as if we are either defenseless or it, this is just in a more aggressive form of mitigation um, and the response fogging gives us better, even more significant coverage. Mm -hmm. uh, but our, our daily surface cleaning provides a significant level of protection every single day. Um, but when we have right an actual case though, then we are required to do that extra step, right? Or no? Well, in terms of required, we, we self-impose that additional step to, to, to respond in that way, in a more aggressive posture. But I would say that our routine surface cleaning is effective in killing the virus itself. And so that, that's very helpful to us as a base level of protection that's already in place. Okay, thank you. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Giovanelli. So that just led me to add, think, so who is going to like train our staff? Who are they, how is that gonna work? It's all part of the plan that is being uh, worked out. What level of training specifically is required has sometimes to do with the specific PPE that they use, which uh, because of the product itself uh, helps determine what level of PPE is required. Uh, and then what is recommended versus what is required. What uh, from an insurance standpoint, for our standpoint will be the optimal combination for that from an OSHA standpoint, if we're having our own workforce doing it. So there's just a lot of factors that go into that. Uh, but our, our intention is to do this as quickly as possible, but do it right for our, our students, our faculties, and also the, the employees who would engage in this behavior. We wanna make sure all those bases are covered. So this is, and this is, this 1.3 million is just strictly labor. It's not using, they're using our machines and our, the, our chemical though, right? That's what I'm sure our, our chemical, their machines, we don't have our own fogging machines. They have their own fogging okay. equipment as well as their own PPE. The, the only thing we, we have is the uh, BioEsk uh, disinfectant. Okay, so are we looking to buy the machines? I thought we were. Was that would be a like part of this plan for us. In order for our own staff to do it, they would need the material You're exactly right, and that's okay. something that that's we're, right. we're working on. Okay, great, thank you. Absolutely, my pleasure. Okay, board members, any further comments for Dr. Savage? Thank you very much, My we pleasure. appreciate that. Thank you. Madam Chair, that's the, those are the questions that we received. Um, there may be additional questions. In the yes. Okay, so we'll see if there are any additional questions and if not, we will move on to our protocol and process review. Uh, Ms. Gittins. I, I'm sorry, I did have a couple of questions, but my, um, our internet was knocked out last night, so I, I couldn't send it back. If necessary, I can uh, get them to the superintendent. I do remember one that was um, G1, if I may. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the question had to do with, um, I, I'd like to see like an org chart of how of the positions at the schools, and I don't know if they're different for elementary, middle, and high school. And <clears throat> the question, excuse me, I've got a sinus thing. Um, the question had to do with the, um, the dean position, and I know that was put in maybe a year or so ago, uh, the dean for, <clears throat> for um, uh, discipline and the question had to do too with is that position, I know they're not an AP, but in several situations there have been people that were in the pool that were told if you do this position, 
of uh, Dean of Discipline, it will help you to get further along in, in your career to being an AP. The question I have about that, though, is that, okay, so someone does the Dean of Discipline position, they get into the pool, more than likely they're going to be hired again for uh, uh, AP for discipline. And, and the issue is there are a lot of people that will say they are not hired because they don't have both curriculum and discipline. And so I'm just wondering how are we, how are they able to do that? Because people do get pigeonholed. They're good at discipline, so we'll put them at this school and they'll do discipline. And that hurts their f future progression because if you don't have both, at least some curriculum, then you know no one wants to hire you at another school and then looking forward to being a principal. Um, so I'm just wondering about that dean position and is it my understanding is it's the teacher salary and the issue with that is it's a teacher salary but they don't get the um the other salary you know uh, perks that go with the teacher as far as the extra even the bonuses for uh, teachers if their kids are you know um um I forget the name of it now, but you know you know what I'm talking about. So it kind of pigeonholes them into this one spot and they don't get any other money that comes out. So how can we address that? Well, I, I think just to, just to respond to the question, um, I would, when you are coming up as a teacher, I think one of the things that if you want to go into administration, I mean, you're typically trying to do responsibilities and duties that are gonna get you doing duties and responsibilities that are similar to uh, an assistant principal. So personally, I took a job at a safety security, per, um, safety security person, which was out on the bus ramp. And so I you did, you know, bus referrals because that's what APs do is they do bus referrals. And then usually your, your assistant principal, the your first job you're gonna get is gonna be you know, that, that discipline job. Referrals. So even if you've done a dean job, you usually you're looking for, if you can hire an assistant principal uh, who's a new assistant principal, but if they've had some experience dealing with discipline, that's a big plus that gets their foot in the door. Then once you, you get that job as the assistant principal doing discipline, then you start working with your administrative team to get into the <coughs> curriculum and the scheduling and so it's just kind of a progression. Uh, I do know that there are people like that you described that have been pigeonholed. Uh, I've worked with some of them myself and trying to, you know, you have to try to encourage uh, them to work with the principals. And I know that, that Dr. Pruitt and Lynn Harrell currently probably do way more than what we've ever done in the past in terms of trying to get our assistant principals <coughs> out of just that mold of being the discipline assistant principal. I, I've known people who literally were APs when I was an AP that we're doing are still, whole time. you know, and right. Um, right. there's very few left, I think, right. you know. Well, and the, and the problem is then when they want to move on, they go for an interview and they're told, well, we need someone that's got, you know, both or knows whatever. And are we providing all that experience to everybody? So I don't know if there's a process now that if you're um, an AP that you do, you know, a year or two of this and a year or two of that, is that a regular process or, and I don't know. If, um, well, I know that like Dr. <coughs> Pruitt and um, Lynn Harrell do work with our assistant principals and ask, and literally the question goes out at the end of the year, would you like another experience, um, you know, working with another administrative team that's for the purposes of getting additional experience to move yourself, um, you know, into a different role, promote, you know, trying to get yourself where you're more promotable. Um, there are, um, we are doing things in my personal opinion uh, in human resources, along these lines that are over and above what we've ever been able to do in the past. And that's because Lynn Harrell is working specifically with professional development and leadership. So you've got 
that <coughs> focus on it like you've not had. And they work a lot more with APs than like back when I was an AP. It just, you know, a lot more is going on. Um, and I think there's more opportunities for people that are, are like you described, that find themselves pigeonholed. Now you can work with human resources and get a different opportunity, maybe work under a different principle that's going to give you more experiences. Uh, working in different areas such as scheduling, such as curriculum and instruction. Okay. All right. Thank you. I think that's okay. Good. Is that it? Uh, yeah. The other things I can just ask him off. Off. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, <coughs> Ms. Giovanelli. I had internet um, issues as well. I sent stuff last night that several emails, and they didn't send until mm. I walked in the building. So um, I'm sending you an email just that you can respond back. But, you know, okay. it's not important enough to, to continue. So I have questions coming from Ms. Giovanelli and Ms. Gittins. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. You're good. I just wanted you to know that. All right. Thing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, it is um, 1.56. <coughs> so we're actually four minutes ahead of schedule. <laughs> Yippee. And we will now move on to the protocol and processes review to include the onboarding process. And that's scheduled for two hours. And at this time, I will welcome Ms. McClung. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So thank you, board members and Dr. Atkins and uh, Attorney Dupay Bruno. <coughs> it's nice to see everybody this afternoon. I'll take just a moment here to get our items up. Thank you. So our purpose this afternoon is to continue our work on the protocol manual. Um, as you might recall, a few weeks ago, we discussed several areas, but we had quite a few items that uh, we still needed to review. The last item we discussed was budget. So we're going to take up right after that, excuse me. And so we will look at each item, um, see if we can come to agreement upon those items, anything that we can't come upon to agreement upon within a few moments or a few minutes, then we'll save some of these items might need to have a workshop of their own. So as we go through those, we can make that, that decision as we work through. For example, the very first item is policy 1.20, which uh, talks about community opportunities for engagement with the board. And the questions that came up about this really have to do with the policy, not necessarily protocol. So if um, you look at those, there was a discussion around is, is the policy itself equitable, um, some language discussion around there, and then um, a suggestion of, of changing some of the language. And really those are all policy related, not protocol related. So um, with your agreement, I would like to postpone that one for a discussion around policy. And at our last meeting, you might recall that policy is now going to be um, looked at by the board attorney. So this is one of the ones that she could review and bring forward for you. Okay, thank you. Yes, Ms. Gittins. And I don't know if this is the appropriate time to do it, to ask if we can, um, you know, for the record, ask for a workshop on policies. And I believe um, Attorney Dupuy Bruno has a few already that there were some questions about that if we can officially schedule to have a workshop around. Attorney Bruno, do you want to respond to that? I think that's probably a good idea. I did have several board members email me about questions on various different policies, most of them dealing with governance in Chapter 1 of our policy. So uh, that would help me in giving me direction as to how to move forward with these policies. So I think that's a good recommendation. Okay. Shall we take a consensus? Um, the consensus as to whether or not you want to move forward with a workshop on policy, specifically chapter one of our policies. Yeah, I, I think that that would be uh, extremely prudent because there are questions on a, a lot of the governance team uh, policies. And I noticed in my um, 
research and review that uh, some of them have not been updated for many years. So I think that uh, I want to be sure that we are in compliance with statute, first of all, and to give us an opportunity to make sure that they are still current and relevant. Thank you. Okay. Chair. Madam Chair. We yes. still need a consensus to make sure that the board. I can't hear you, Ms. Bruno. We still need a consensus to make sure that the board wants to move forward with that workshop, right, the yes, particular workshop. Yes, and I think workshop. I saw all thumbs up and one sidewards. Okay. And Ms. Morgan, are you in agreement? Okay. Six for now. Thank you. <coughs> A happy camper. Someone does not want to go to school. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. McClung, do you want to continue? Yes, ma'am. Okay, you. so you, um, those will come back then with the policy. The next question was around committee assignments, and the question was, didn't we change this? And, and yes, we did. The changes, though, are what is currently in your protocol manual. So the change was made from assigning committee members in November. Instead, we now assign all committee members from a, a, a July 1 to June 30th time frame. If there is a change on the board, then um, the, the new person would just take over the responsibilities of whoever, whatever that board member had. But that was the change that was agreed upon at last year's um, reorganization meeting. Right. Are you going page by page or what? I'm going the the uh, the spreadsheet. Give us up. Okay. okay. What number are you on? I guess. Um, uh, twenty-five. Well, she's on twenty. Page two. Twenty-four. Bottom of page the page. Page twenty-four. 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 Committee assignments. Okay. Are there any other questions uh, around those assignments? No. <clears throat> Okay, thank you. The next item was around graduation, and there, um, the request was to add specifics for at-large members, and then um, also one around cap and gowns, but let's start with the at-large members. And I don't know who had requested this, but if you could clarify exactly what you would like to have on there. Ms. Vaughn. Oh, okay, and of course this year was very different, but, um, <laughs> The first year that I was on, on the board, I was kind of excited. Yeah, you get to go to some of the schools. And basically, I was told by our office manager um, that at-large people do the, the charter schools. And um, <clears throat> I said, okay, I don't get to do at least one. No, that's done you know, by, and, and so apparently there's, there's some kind of unwritten rule. And this year before the COVID happened, um, months before, I said, you know, last year I didn't get to do any and I'd like to do one of our, of our schools. No, it's already been worked out. If you can, you know, maybe one of your, the board members will switch with you or, I, I don't know. I don't. I don't see that as equitable. Mm -hmm. um, and I understand that. Um, you know, if if you have a single member district, <clears throat> that that's what you want to do. You want to go to your schools. But um, and I'm not trying to put anything down on the, on the charter schools. I went to some very nice, enjoyable graduations, but. I just think it would be nice to actually participate in it in at least one of our, what do we have now, 14 high schools. And the protocol right now does not actually assign anyone to, I was trying to pull it up here, but it's not showing up very well, but I can read it to you. Right now it, it simply says that. Um, what pink? I can't see on this. The, I'm, I'm not gonna do, it's on page 21, 21 if you have right, your document you. up, it is on page 21. And Right now it says the board office manager will work with board members to ensure all school ceremonies, including those of charter schools, have a board representative in attendance. So it does not specify which ones go to which school. Right. And, and Ms. McClung, 
on, on our screen where the manual is up, mm -hmm. it's only at 48%. Uh, so yeah, I think that's I what I was trying to switch here, and it's yeah. Not, I'm, I'm maybe there. We go. There maybe. we go. Okay, that that's much more helpful. There we go. And and I I there was a conversation I think right um, before graduation, and I know this was a different year, and we didn't end up doing our usual, but I think we had <coughs> made a proposal that because there are 14 traditional high schools and seven board members that each of us would do two high schools. And, you know, unless anybody else had special requests and then ar arranged it among themselves. But I, I would suggest that that might be a reasonable um, plan for now. I mean, and, well, and as well, the board changes and as our- Well, and I actually even change. talked to Dr. Atkins on that in, in one of our one-on- ones because, and, and maybe it was, you know, we had a wonderful office manager, but I, I can tell you, she told me, no, it's already been planned. Mr. Simmons and I have worked on this and, and it's already been planned that people are doing their, their schools in their district. Right, so moving forward, I think that we can then uh, come up with something a lot more equitable and give everyone the opportunity. Should it be something in writing? Ms. Dupree Bruno, do you think some, some, some of these, you know, they become traditions. Right, and, and our protocols are a work in progress because change is constant and inevitable, so I think that we could put it in there and then if a, a future board wants to make it something different, they would have the opportunity to do that. Yeah, I would agree that it should be in the manual to give guidance and anytime something is written, it's always better. So everybody's on the same page. I would recommend that it be put into the manual because anytime something is written, everybody's on the same page and understands. So that will be my recommendation. Yes. But then you also have to add the charter schools, you have to add the technology technology schools. I mean, all of that is part of that. Right, right. Um, and and so. that and traditionally, the list included all of those. This was a very unusual year, but traditionally, it, it all did get covered. And some of us were doing three or four, and, and some of the dates are different for some of the charters. But I think that I think that we can accommodate that. And when the list is created for that particular year, because we are increasing in our numbers of schools and and charters, uh, then we can. I'm sure that adult professionals can work that out, but I, I agree that if we said traditional high schools would be covered by all board members from all seven um, from the five districts and the two at large. Okay, Thank so you. so I want to be sure that I'm hearing it correctly. So the language would change to indicate that traditional schools no. would be divided between the between all seven board members and charters and special schools would also be divided, duties would be divided between the board members. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yes, Ms. Gittins. Now, I, I don't know, and I'm not being selfish. I do know that, um, you know, it, it's, and maybe it is just a tradition or whatever, but doing the high schools in the area that you represent is, is kind of an important thing. And I understand um, sharing that with others, and maybe that could be worked out to to rotate that with some of the at large um, members. But I I feel a certain way about doing the high schools that are in my, especially in my district. Uh, and and we can work out something to alternate one or whatever. But I don't know that I would want to give up the the schools in my district that I work with all the time. Understanding that all board members represent the whole district and that we are a governance team, I think that we can work that out when the time comes, but we will make sure that everyone has an opportunity to participate in the end of the year graduation ceremonies if they should occur in future years. Ms. Giovanelli and then Ms. Jordan. Well, I just wanted to remind everyone that we will have a new school Yes, uh, and, and that's going to, it's not going to be 14, it'll be 15 high schools. So, it, it, you know, and so we do have to 
you know, spread, sometimes some of the graduations are going to be at the same time, so it's just not going to be humanly possible. And and I, like I have a lot of um, high schools in my district, but I think that sharing that and we can pick and we normally have a meeting and we say, okay, I'd like to do this one, I'd like to do that. Well, we didn't have that this year, so it was selected for us. <coughs> so. Um, that's important to know that it just wasn't like you said a normal normal year so i think you know we have to understand that we have to share the wealth of our high schools <laughs> well because we are the board we are a team and individually yeah. we don't make decisions we make it as a group so i mean and i honestly, think we'll be fine. i would like to see all of us at the graduation of gateway's um first class i would love to see i think every board member at the very first yeah, so, I mean, that, there's, some, there's things that can change and it's, you know, everything's going to be evolving. So I think you have to, like you said, you know, so. Work in progress. That, yes, exactly. So Thank I, you. So Thank that's you. my opinion. Thank you. Ms. Jordan. And, and I was going to say the same thing, that we, with this, um, I know we all represent the whole entire uh, Lee County. However, when they look at us, the people who call us are the people who live in our district because they believe that you are that person that's supposed to be representing them because of where you, the district that you are in. And even with um, the last two years, I mean, even um, Susan had come to us and said, you know, this is how we're doing it this year. Do you mind doing it um, this way, giving up one of the schools? And I know for uh, two years, Ms. Patrika has taken Dunbar because we've talked to each other and said, okay, would you mind doing this one? And I'm gonna, because we are adults, we are grown and we can have, conversations where brought us to who was taken over what um, over what schools so I just you know to me putting it like saying well, this is what you have to do or else because then it's going to come the issue of well, okay who's going to go to what charter school and who's going to take care of Cape Coral tech technical and who's going to take care of this school it's going to come down to that well, and, and I think because we're a team, we can work that out when the time comes and we know the numbers and the dates and the names of the schools. Ms. Fisher. Yes, Ms. Gittins. I just wanted to add, I, like I said, I'm not trying to just be greedy about it or anything like that. What I was saying and, and uh, comment to what uh, uh, Ms. Jordan just said, I think it was Ms. Uh, uh, Giovanelli came to me and was saying that, you know, one of her grandkids or someone was graduating from a specific school and they'd like to do it. And so we worked it out. Um, but I just, I just, anyway, I will leave it. And I don't want it to seem like I'm just not trying to share with everyone else. Oh, so and, please, and don't, I think that please that, don't put that as the reason that I said right. that. Right. And, and Ms. Giovanelli? Well, it was actually my cousin, but, um, but we can still attend the school, you can, if still, if it's another one, another board member, there could be more than one board member. That's my point. That's all I'm saying. So I don't think it's a problem. It should not be. Right. Thank you. Ms. Vaughn. I think there needs to be some specific language. It doesn't have to say everybody should have two, but I think it should say that the at-large members should have an opportunity to do it. I don't think... Um, you know, for instance, knowing how Miss Gittens feels, I'd feel really bad saying, um, hey, Gwen, uh, you have X number of schools and I have only charter schools. Give me one of yours to be. I mean, the yeah. first the first year I was really kind of surprised. And then I saw another at large member have one of our schools and realized that her friend said, hey, why don't you take. And, and I, I don't think it should depend on 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 that. I I, I think right. that and, and um, I think yeah. And, and I think and the charter schools are part of what we do. And as I said, I had no problem. There were some very lovely graduations, they are. but it would be a nice experience for me mm -hmm. to go to at least one of our schools. And I don't think that's asking a lot. And I don't mm -hmm. think. The at-large members should have to beg other members, and, and um, I'll, I'll be honest, 
um, Susan said to me, no, that's not how it's done. Right, we understand that, but uh, you know, this is a different day and, we're, and I know that Ms. McClung will come up with the perfect wording that we can approve when we so, review it. And so, um, and we just and spent 18 minutes on this, so I wanna move on because the last time we uh, went through our protocols and processes, we ran out of time and, and we don't wanna do that again this, today. So let's try to move on and then Ms. Dr. Atkins. Just the, the only thing I was going to say is that, that I, I know that's maybe what I understand that's what she told you, but you know, this is, this is relatively new that we're seven members. I mean, yes. really, I mean, and, and so there wasn't, I don't recall any, anything being set in stone in, in terms of you have to go to this graduation, you no. have to go to that graduation. Mrs. Giovanelli is absolutely correct too, that I've seen many times where more than one board member attends, you know, and then you know, it's just decided who's going to be the one board member that, that, you know, receives the class. Receives the class. Yeah. But, um, you know, I think it's just something you all need to, to work out and. It'll be fine. We'll work it out. Thank you. And I appreciate your faith, Mrs. Fisher. <laughs> I'm sure we'll be able to come up with some wording that will be appropriate. Uh, the next item related to graduation, the current wording now says that a cap and gown will be more ordered for each board member. And then there was um, a request to just change that to say that each board member who does not choose to use their own. Is that acceptable to everyone? That's fine. Okay. Thank Great. you. The next item um, was a request to add the Florida Department of Education standards and requirements to the appendices. I'm not clear exactly what that request is. Is If it's simply they want to have the standards added, would a link suffice if we could get some clarity around that? Okay, is, do we know which board member suggested that? I believe Mrs. Gittin suggested that, but here she is, we'll find out for sure. Ms. Gittins, did you request um, that uh, for the appendices to add Florida Department of Education standards and requirements? Uh, yes, I believe I did. <laughs> I'm trying, I was trying to find some cough drops. Huh? Um. <laughs> <laughs> I was just asking for a little clarification around that if you wanted the standards added or a link to a specific web page for the FLDOE. Um, I believe, I'm trying to recall, I'm doing this. Thank you. Um, I would have to look back onto my notes and from the last time, um, but it was basically just <clears throat> the requirements that we had, I believe were just either ours or FSBA. And I just wanted to make sure that we had the uh, DOE with it as well. But I'll, I'll look into it and get back to you. Okay, thank you. So, Ms. Gittins, are you talking about the academic standards or? Um, sure, exactly. Because that would be mammoth. I mean, the link, and, and that's all available in academic services. Okay. Let's just skip over it, and I'll get back to you, Cindy, about it. I mean, uh, you know. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next item was around the job description for the board attorney. Um, and there was a question about does, did it need an update and then also the board auditor job description and that has been added. But I'm not clear what the question was around the board attorney's job description. Okay. Probably. I, I think that um, there was some discussion at one point uh, regarding the board, board attorney's job description being updated because we have had additional um, responsibilities and you know times are changing so um, I do believe that there was Miss uh, Attorney Bruno do you have an updated job description I have a job description that includes the contract terms in addition to the original job de job description oh, okay and that might have been it because it was not consistent with the contract or additional things from the contract that was not necessarily in the job description. Right, okay. And then I don't, do we have a board auditor job description and I don't know if Dr. Pruitt. We do and that's already been added. Pardon me? We do have that and it's been added. 
Okay. It's Thank been added you. to the protocol. So, um, Attorney Dupree Bruno, if it, we'll get together and, and make sure we have the correct one in the manual then. Thank you. I believe there was also a question around that title. Did the title of that change? Right. <clears throat> I, I believe that there's ongoing discussion and I guess it hasn't been um, finalized on exactly um, the job title. Ms. Ms. Dupree Bruno, did you have any updates on that, weren't you? And, and uh, Mr. Williams and the whole legal department talking about um, slightly changed titles? So there, there was some discussion. I don't really have any additional updates to that. Mr. Williams is um, on paternity leave at this time. My recommendation would be perhaps to wait till he comes back and then we can pretty much um, discuss that. Okay, so once it's finalized, things can be amended or changed. I think we're probably gonna need some board direction and guidance with regards to that. Um, there's just some confusion with regards to our titles when it comes to um, the public, certain even outside counsel. So there's a little bit of confusion we just need to clear up, but I'm sure we're able to do that. Okay, right. Good. And, and I, if I may just add a little, um, I, I have done some research. I participated in the meeting with Dr. Atkins, Mr. Williams, and Attorney Bruno. And so um, I, I think the it came to our attention when there was a question from the Florida School Board's Attorneys Association regarding who's our general <coughs> counsel. And if you Google Lee County School District General Counsel, you get Mr. Williams' name. Mr. Williams is our chief legal counsel. However, um, that's, that's not, you know, it, traditionally, again, traditionally and historically in the state of Florida in districts, the general counsel is the school board attorney. Mm -hmm. So there was some confusion about that. And then with um, uh, other attorneys who were participating um, by contract and uh, in, in some of our um, litigation discussions were not clear on who was the general counsel. And the school mm -hmm. board attorney is the general counsel. So uh, according to um, F, FSBAA and FSBA and um, the Department of Education. So we just wanted to be able to clarify that and add that general counsel title to our school board attorney's uh, card or yeah. identifier. That's why I brought it up. Yeah. That was what brought it up, yes. Wouldn't uh, Ms. Williams, they be, if, if it was general counsel, general staff counsel? I mean, there has to be some differentiation, or otherwise it gets confusing. Yeah, I think he said that um, <clears throat> he, he is like one of the chiefs, so he is chief staff counsel. Right, but and that's it, fine, it, chief staff counsel, but just that general counsel That would be like a means. word change, but of course, um, and he's aware of, of all that, and, and perhaps uh, according to Attorney Bruno's discussion, we could, um, you know, revisit that we could decide to add general counsel to her title right now, or we could um, wait till uh, Mr. Williams returns from his leave to um, have an agreement on that. And then I have Ms. Patrika and then Ms. Giovanelli. I'm completely unprepared to have a discussion surrounding this because it was my understanding that we would be taking a, a comprehensive look at all legal services in the district after um, Attorney Williams returns. So I would ask for your professional courtesy and put this off until after that so I can do the research I need to do to make an informed decision. Okay, and we've had this discussion at the table before. Yeah. And right. I, and My I last was discussion with Attorney Dupree Bruno was that this is a discussion that would take place at the board table after oh, Mr. Sorry. Williams returns. I was returns. not aware of that. So when no, I saw this no. on today's backup material, I, I just, I didn't spend the time on it. But because it's been on there since we Correct. submitted our questions. Correct. Okay, Ms. Giovanelli. Well, we've been in discussion with this several times. Uh, we, we've talked about this. So, I mean, I'm ready today to make that decision because I think yeah, any more, any more time, the public is confused. And then not only the public, but we have other um, legal, uh, we have attorneys that are confused. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important to have that 
you know, clear and communicated and tr being transparent with that. And I don't see the delay because, uh, you know, uh, it's already been delayed as far as I'm concerned. I, so. I asked, please, as a professional courtesy, could you put yeah. it off so that we can okay. follow our okay. own board attorney's suggestion to have a comprehensive look at all legal services and make decisions at that time? So please, as a professional courtesy. I think we could still do that, but I think we could put the general yeah. counsel. Mrs. Morgan. Yeah, oh, I would like to say, and, and say simply that I think this is a matter that can be settled amongst the people who are serving as attorneys in the Lee County School District. Let them make the decision about how the title position should be titled and come back to the board with their recommendation if it's been incorporated in the protocol. And Ms. Gittins and Mrs. Giovanelli again. Okay. In my understanding, and I heard you say it, Chair, and Mr. Pre Bruno, that there was a meeting with um, the superintendent, yourself as the chair representing us, and Mr. Williams, if this was discussed, mm. and it was discussed prior to that, and it was discussed, I remember back in the fall when we were deciding to do that differentiation of title, and I had brought it up then that I felt that it would be confusing. And so now it's come back again. I, it's already been talked about by them. It's been on our uh, uh, docket before. I just think we need to just make the differentiation and everyone is aware of it. So <laughs> what else do we need to wait for? Just to say, to change in title. Everything else that has to do with the attorneys for the staff, for the district and for us, they can work out you know, who meets with who and whatever. But I just think that needs to be, there's already been confusion of attorneys uh, contacting the district or information not getting to our attorney in a timely manner. And a lot of it had to do with the title. So it's yes. a simple thing of saying this, change the title. Thank you very much. Okay. And Mrs. Giovanelli? All I was gonna say is everything that uh, Ms. Gittins just said, but also I was just gonna ask, um, Mr. Pre Bruno, your recommendation and your opinion. My recommendation is that since Mr. Williams is not here, I think with regards to legal services, any discussion about that, and, I, and it's also my understanding that this took place, I think last year, around October, November, bring it back to the board so that the board can take a look directly in terms of the legal services. I think that's one issue. With regards to a title and just clarifying that, that's something completely different. Legal services, what they do, how they operate, that's one issue. Clarifying titles is something completely different. So I, that's basically my recommendation to the board. I, I, thank you very much, I appreciate that. So then um, there's been a request. I think sorry, it's too simple. But that's not reflective of the conversation that I had with you surrounding this. It, my understanding was that all discussions surrounding surrounding legal department, legal services, titles, everything. Excuse me, point off. of order. Uh, Phyllis, Miss, didn't you someone just else interrupt was the chair? On. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was just asking her a question based so, on what she just said. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to step on you. I really didn't. Okay. I'm sorry. I made eye contact with her. And I'm Ms. sorry. No, Ms. Petrika. No. Ms. Petrika. Yeah. With regards to legal services, the department, how it operates, how it runs, whether or not things are going well, whether or not um, there are savings of funds, anything with regards to legal, to, you know, legal services, I would recommend that we wait until Mr. Williams comes back and then we can do a thorough evaluation for that. I have no issues with that whatsoever. With regard, and if you want to include the title in that discussion, that's fine as well. I'm hearing what the board is saying now. There has been confusion and you know, it's up to the board what they wanna do in terms of just clarifying the title issue. That's completely different. That's all we're talking about. And if the issue is putting general counsel with the school board attorney, if that's what it is, is the issue and there's not comfort with that, that's fine. But I think having school board attorney and chief legal counsel has been making things a little muddy and it has been confusing. So, th I mean, that's, that's all I have to say about that particular issue, but I do agree that any other discussion needs to wait until November. 
and you can include, you know, adding or not adding general counsel to that in November as well, but I'm just saying that I think there's some confusion. And <coughs> at, at, Ms. Jordan. I, I'm sorry, I, I feel that, um, that we should wait as well. And the only reason I'm saying that is because I did re wait. wait to decide on this because in all the correspondence that we have had, we have received, this is exactly what it said that was gonna take place when a person left for, for leave. And I just think that, to me, that's, we need to have, Sorry, could you I'm clarify, very confused I don't about understand what you're saying. We have received correspondence back and forth on this issue about the yes. different names and what that looks like. And there has been some confusion. But at the end, when we received an email, it wasn't from Brian, but we did receive from Mr. Williams stating that when he goes away, that you know, this is kind of going to take place where we would. Excuse me? I, I'm what? confused. Okay. There was an email. Confused because I don't think I saw anything like that. I didn't. Yeah. Uh -uh. Yeah, if, you, if you read back on the emails of things that went back and forth, it stated that when he goes away for leave, that we would take action on something. Things would be taking place. Now, maybe I misunderstood what I read. Or maybe I just had a I, bad dream about this. Ms. Madam Chair, I do, I do know what Ms. Jordan is referencing. I, I do understand what she's saying. So given that particular, um, basically there was concerns that board would take action on the legal department and legal issues while Mr. Williams was not present. Right. And I don't think that, I would not recommend that the board do that. I think that this has to be handled when Mr. Williams does return. So I, I do understand what Ms. Jordan was saying. And, and thank you very much for that. Attorney Bruno, I think you've been very clear about that. And, and I'm confused, and this is a perfect example of not all board members having the same information because I, everybody did receive, it, it was copied to everybody. Everybody's <coughs> was on it. Uh, Ms. Gittins. Okay, <laughs> to clarify. As Mr. Prebruno said, we are talking about two different issues. We are talking about what Mr. Williams said in his uh, uh, email about making decisions about the, the way the legal department and everything is set up. And yes, I agree, he should be involved in that. This is not the, the name or the title is not something, number one, he's aware that he's not aware of. He met with you and discussed it. He is aware of that. He is not going to end up making the decision. We have to make the decision as the board. So there are two separate things here. We are not stepping over Mr. Williams in looking at and changing the title. It was discussed with him, it was brought up, it was you know, <laughs> it's documented, so it's something we do. The rest of all the discussion in that email is a separate issue that, yes, should wait for him to return. Thank you. Ms. Vaughn. Our task today is to review the protocols. Thank you. And don't we do this once a year and then, right? Okay, I'm not sure when it needs to be final, finalized, but I think just the title needs to align with what we're going to have in the future. If not, we're gonna have this document wrong for the next year until we get back to it, unless we can do an amendment. Yes, uh, anytime there is a, a change no. to a document, we can make that change whenever, and I just send out an, an updated version. That way, because it's, for most people, we access it digitally. Correct. Okay, so kind of as a compromise on this, because I agree, it should be with Mr. Williams here if we discuss that one, but since our job here is to revise and make it as accurate as possible, you know, maybe we can go ahead and just say, this is something that we earmark it. It needs to be changed and updated because I remember 
uh, one of the one-on-ones with um, Attorney Dupree Bruno was that there was uh, like FSBA, there was a big confusion and as has already been cited here at the dais, um, people, sometimes she doesn't get information, the proper information because of the title and that's all that we're talking about is, is a title. But if we can update with um, a revision on the title as soon as we can get to that, sure. I, I could live with it. I'd rather just do it now, but I, I could live with that. Ms. Jordan. And I understand what you're saying, the revision, it's just a revision of title, but we sat here uh, probably it was a year ago that we had this whole conversation of what that looks like and how this title was because there was several different options for us to choose from. And that's how we chose for it to be called. So May, we mm -hmm. chose for him to be have that title name. And then May I Ms. Respond Dr. Prude's back there and so she knows how that name, the names, can you please, am I correct in what I'm saying? But at the so we did choose to do that as a board, we chose to give him that name, so for us to take that back from him, we that we do have to to have this conversation because you just don't say, okay, you're not a board member anymore, you're going to be called this. We we have to make we have to have that conversation because we are the ones who said this is appropriate, this is what how it's going to the how it's going to look. You're going to be called this, this is going to be called this, and we're going to come down, and it's going to be a wonderful thing. And so we've had the conversation for almost a year. Yes. And really, I wasn't talking about taking anyone's title away. I was talking about adding general counsel right. per what we do all over the state of Florida and per Florida School Boards Attorneys Association and FSBA so that some of that confusion regarding our board attorney's ability to gather information and do her job representing us would be maximized. So my suggestion at this point is that we update her title now to include general counsel. The rest of it, they can work out at another time when they meet as a team of attorneys. Ms. Vaughn. In response to Ms. Jordan, that's true. But at the time, we had no idea of the confusion that would be generated. And so that's why what we said then um, to me, needs to be revised. And we did not have an in-house school board attorney. We had a Exactly. Ms. Gittins. And just for the record, no, I, I did not vote for that. And the reason, if you go back to the meeting, that I did not vote for it was just this conversation, that it would be confusing as to whose job was what. So. Thank you. Okay. At this time... So Attorney Bruno, for a, a protocol change, all we need to do is have a consensus, right? To change it in the document, yes. But you'll need to have, at some point, you'll need to have a formal vote. Okay. So my recommendation would be when, at some point, if there's a discussion or a workshop on the legal services, at that point, you can make your final recommendation and then you can go to the action meeting and have your formal vote. If you want to have a consensus today on adding the general counsel, you're able to do that, but that's just basically for the for this document. Yes. You okay. have to Ms. you have to look at the actual job description for a board attorney and it has to be in that because that's what drives the responsibility of of her job, not not the protocol document. Um Ms. Patrika. I was just going to say this requires a formal vote of the yes. board anyways because it is a change of title on the job description. Okay. Uh, we do good of the order tomorrow. I'm sorry. This is a workshop, so we don't have no, tomorrow. Could we do a good of the order tomorrow and add, add it as a good of the order? Yes. Okay. So can we? I'm sorry. Can we take consensus now that we will do that? That we'll add it on. Yes. To thank you. Okay. okay. So can I just ask one more question? I've been on the board for four years, and this confusion has only occurred over the last six months. Why is it that? Attorney, um, prior board attorneys, there was never any confusion when they're, when they're. Because um, the board attorney was the general counsel and there you. was no chief legal counsel. Thank you. This was an added. There was thing. a staff attorney. 
Okay, so do we have a consensus that we will uh, bring up for consideration as soon as possible, the ch not anything about legal services or their operation, but a change of title or a, an addition to the school board attorney's title of general counsel. Can I ask one question before? Yes, Ms. Joy. So if we're changing or adding general counsel to uh, school board attorney, that means we're changing Mr. Williams' title. No, why would we oh, be changing? How is he going to stay the general still counsel? Chief legal counsel. Not general counsel. Chief. What, is, what, is his, what is his title right now at Chief this moment? Chief legal counsel. He's not the general counsel. Okay. It's not even, it's not even affecting him. It's totally her. It's so, clarifying her, her position. Board members, may I make a recommendation? Honestly, um, I would recommend that you hold off on this consensus because by doing chief legal counsel and general counsel, you're basically the same position with the same responsibilities, the same title. So I think we need to flush this out a little bit. I do appreciate the board willing to act upon this quickly, but I think that will add, believe it or not, additional confusion if we don't address the chief legal counsel part as well. So my recommendation is in November or October that we evaluate all of this and then come and make a determination so that roles and responsibilities are clear and everybody knows what they are supposed to do and what their function is. Because I think that just adding general counsel is gonna make it a little bit more confusing with chief legal counsel. Any attorney that does not know the internal processes and system of this operation will be completely confused. Thank you, okay. Yes. Okay, so then when Mr. Williams returns, we'll have this conversation and make, and make a formal motion and a vote. Yes, Ms. Gittins. Uh, Ms. Uh, Giovanelli is first and then I'll go after Oh, I'm her. sorry. My only question is when does Mr. Williams return? Dr. Pruitt? Um, I don't know off the top of my head, but we can get you that answer. It's intermittent, so. So then could he come in for a quick workshop? Well, it would have to be a meeting. I, I would caution, since he's on paternity leave, we don't really want to yes. expose ourselves to having him come in when he's already been approved for this particular leave. So I, I'm pretty sure he'll be back towards the end of October, at least by November, he should be back, because I think he's gone for about three to four weeks. Okay. Um, so we'll put down date to be determined and Ms. Gittins. Okay. Again, so that everyone understands when we had the meeting to discuss this in the first place last year, I believe it was Ms. Patrika and Mr. Williams both said, when I said, well, you know, this could be confusing and their answer was that general counsel and chief legal counsel are the same and therefore it was not going to be confusing it's in the meeting you can go back and see it yourself and the i said well it sounds like it will be confusing i don't know why all of the other attorneys that we've had had the designation and all of a sudden it was changed that was my question then, that's my question now. So yes, I agree with Mr. P. Bruno. We can't just give her the same title because they're saying that they're, we were told it's the same thing. So that's where the confusion started in the very beginning. Thank you, okay. So then we, we will um, take this under advisement as soon as we know when Mr. Williams will be available. Okay, Ms. Okay, thank you. So um, I will not change anything in protocol. When a decision has been made, we can easily go back and update the documents. We'll do that at that time. Thank you. The next item is board secretary, and it was just a suggestion um, for Susan's uh, exit interview, Ms. Johnson, that questions be asked of her for any recommendations. So I, I don't know if that exit interview has taken place. I don't know. So. 
does not. So, uh, and Miss Johnson has generally been very willing to to help out since she's left. So, if um, if the board would like, I could certainly reach out to her and just ask her to give us some some suggestions, um, some things that she found helpful that uh, in terms of characteristics or specific skills that that person might need. If that's the type of information that you're seeking. Thank you very much, and board members. Okay, Ms. Gittens. Um, since that subject is up, I think that it's, and tell me if it's not appropriate to bring it this time, in that we are hiring another secretary, and I was told that it's it has never not ever been done that the board or the current secretary gets to be a part of that process. I know that we received information there were eight uh, the kind of finalists and then it was broken down to three. And I would like the board to discuss the fact that since we work you know, integrally with that person, that we should at least have some type of you know, conversation, not a hard, fast interview necessarily, but have some input on the board secretary and that definitely our current secretary should be involved in that process. Normally in other departments and schools in the district when they are interviewing for a position at that location, they will have the people that will be involved on a day-to-day -day basis involved in that interview because they know, you know the position and they know what the job is. So I'm asking to open that up for discussion. Thank you, Ms. Gittins. Okay, board Oh, members. and I'm sorry, I forgot one more thing. There are, and I did look into it, there are several other districts that the, um, the board, uh, the secretarial staff does report to the board itself. And they do the evaluations and, and that type of thing. So um, it's not something that's unusual for us to do that. There's several other uh, districts that do, according to FSPA. Thank you. So, uh, Ms. Giovanelli? Well, I can add to that. Initially, my first year on the board, we did the evaluations, and then that changed um, the last three years. So, <coughs> I think we do need to have this defined. Um, I believe they work directly with us, and there should be some compatibility or some, we should have a little bit of a say, I think, you know, I'm not saying we need to get into completely involved, but I think we need to see who we're hiring <coughs> and how that's gonna work in our, you know, in our boardroom. Okay, so yes, Ms. Pacheco. So I, um, I did conduct uh, an uh, evalu evaluation of sorts. It wasn't an evaluation. It was where I believe Dr. Atkins office requested feedback regarding job performance of um, the I think the difference is that you know, the one year she was referring to that that staff provided her a copy of the evaluation you did a formal. instrument and, and they did that. And other years it's been where they've asked, just solicited comments. I mean, ultimately the evaluation the actual formal evaluation I do, but I do it based on feedback from the board. So it doesn't matter to me how you want to provide that feedback. Um, it's just, it was really just two different ways of doing it because I think you had two different people that managed it. One that provided you a copy of the o overall evaluation. Um, as I recall, most people didn't do it. Um, and then others that just provided, you know, let, after that year, we just asked for comments. And, and again, I've provided those comments every year. I've been on the board and um, we, come, we come and go. As board members, we come and go. You, you know, the gelling of personalities is not essential to the function of the job with the board. I think that the, the fit in that office is more important than a fit with us. I, I'm, I think that the fact that you shared um, resumes with us is about as much input as we should have in this process. They, the secretaries don't work for us, they work for Dr. Atkins. Those are comments. Thank you, okay. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, think, uh, I think that working together on a daily basis and, and you know, some, sometimes people come and go, but it's still, 
uh, four years of, of time working with the board. And, and I appreciate that we are able to provide the superintendent with um, uh, uh, information for his evaluation. Uh, and I, I think that uh, when we had a change in the board office uh, several years back, we did give input into um, the hiring. And I think, Ms. Stilwell, did you say that you were gonna be sending us the resumes of the finalists? Sure. I did in last week's board update. My, I'm sorry, but I've had... Uh, uh, no, and, and I'm sorry, but I must have missed some, some of that because um, I just had Mr. Jones looking at my stuff this morning because I've missed some emails again. But um, okay, so we have the interview. The, we have the resumes for the finalist. And yes, Ms. Gittins. I, I guess I'm asking then, what is the purpose of us just having the the resumes? I mean, how do we get our thoughts? Or you know, we just look at the interviews. How do we give any input? How do we know if we um, have not even met the people that? I we're think looking. we would provide that back to Dr. Atkins. Well, and, and you know, you were saying, yes, it's four years, but some people have already been here. I mean, you've been here 10, you know, much longer than that. Um, you know, Ms. Morgan has. So it's, it's not to me saying, oh, we're only here for a time. I think it's more that we do the job, we're there, we kind of know a little bit of what, what to look for in a person. So, okay, anyway. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments? Oh, Ms. Vaughn. I, I would just like to see our input a little more formalized somehow. Okay. Because we do, even though <clears throat> it's not our employee it's the person that we work with and, and really, really rely on for so many things, especially when we're brand new, asking a lot of questions. And, and, and so um, it would be, it'd be nice to have a little more, even like if 20% if of the evaluation is school board, you know, I don't know. How, if that's possible, if, if that's not possible, just a, a formalized. Right, right. And I, and I think Dr. Acton said that he really bases his final evaluation on the input from the board members. So the valuation, I think, is covered. <coughs> and I think if we have suggestions after reviewing the resumes that we send them to Dr. Atkins' office. Okay. Okay, Ms. McClung. Thank you. Um, the, there was another item uh, around that, but I think that was covered, adding specifics for board input, and that discussion seemed to cover that. So I'll move on to the superintendent's evaluation. And there was a request to add communication either in each section or as a separate section. So I'd open that for discussion. Ms. Gittins. Well, it was, it was my suggestion and we, um, very often bring up the fact of communication and how important it is. So that was why I put it in there. And we actually don't have any way of, um, um, you know, evaluating it or, or discussing it besides our comments. And while I'm talking about the evaluation, one thing we, we need to be more specific and time certain and when we do both our evaluation as board governance team and the superintendents um, because otherwise it slips through the cracks and we never get it completed. So I think we need to have more time certain and we need to add communication some way, shape or form um, as a it, it kind of goes across the board, so maybe adding communication to the the process and the forms themselves. I believe it's the um, the interim evaluation has a form and a format to put something and put comments. The final does not, 
So in the two years that I've had to do it, I've had to do a separate document uh, in order to put my comments. So I'd like to see us kind of combine what we do with the interim and with the final to have that form there so we just could put what we want and put a comment beside it. Um, yeah, I, I don't. Are you aware of what I was talking about? I'm, I'm not sure that I understand what you mean about time certain. Somehow we tend to, it gets pushed back or changed or whatever, and I think there's some wording that says it has to be done during particular time. We need to set then each year if we need to set a time certain to get it done. We have honestly never completed our evaluation for this year. I think we, we did the superintendents, but we didn't take the final step as to what's going to happen and what are we looking for in the coming year. Right. That was and, not done. Right, and I understand that this has been uh, just an, an unusual year and that a lot of things maybe got moved around and were not completed in a timely fashion, but I'm sure that moving forward we will make every effort to be sure that that happens and that we follow through on the follow-up um, discussion. And so and Madam we Chair, we, we actually, um, the board office manager had put together a timetable for those. Um, she puts out the, um, the draft and asks everyone to fill it out and get it back to her by a certain date. Yes. And then we do have a workshop around each of those. And this past year, we, um, you may recall, we had them together and then we ended up separating them. Um, so th when we did the review of the superintendent's evaluation, there were actually some, um, some uh, opportunities for improvement that were discussed. There was the, the, the um, positives and the opportunities for improvement and the superintendent actually brought back um, action plans based upon those and we have an update on those coming to you in, in October, but those were developed and brought back to the board. Right. I, I, that, I thought I remember. Documentation that we submitted prior to was literally submitted a month prior to the evaluation being due and was submitted on time. Actually ahead of time. Yes. Right. And I think our meetings for discussion were um, postponed because we were meeting virtually. Okay, any other comments? Okay. So can we get a, a thought from the board then about putting something about communication or not? So I adding to what we have is that what you're suggesting yes just find an area that where you can type in comments well that's one thing but the the, the concept of communication that's I, and I mean I think communication is always a big discussion and I think it's <clears throat> inherent in each one of the areas mm -hmm. if I'm remembering correctly and I'd have to pull it up Yes, Ms. Morgan is. Ms. Morgan actually is. Remember, I s suggested we have a workshop regarding communication. So maybe we yes, get that a little and that's, more. And it's on the list. And clarified then maybe. I, but I'm trying to understand what Ms. Gittens is wanting. I mean, are are you saying like when we get an email and we get, send it to the superintendent, what happens after that? The resolution, because that's sometimes what I never know the outcome. You know, I don't get the information of if it was resolved. So that would be a communication issue that I was gonna bring up when we had our workshop. Well, I, and I can bring it up at the workshop, but that wasn't exactly what I was saying. Okay. I was saying that, and I have spoken about it before, that communication seems to be an issue uh, on several fronts. And that's why I'm just saying if it was in there as an item, I, I know I usually bring it up in my evaluation, but I just add it as this is an issue with this, and we can continue. I can continue to do that if no one else has a I'm talking about a line item for that, but it is the actual in, evaluation. It is I understand. Those, uh, I think we might need to drill down on that exactly. I think with the communication thing. So that's my that was my point. But 
Okay. Any other input, board members? Okay, thank you. Ms. Klong, would you please move on? Yes, ma'am. Um, just, um, you had mentioned the communication for board and stakeholders workshop that is tentatively set for October 19th. Right. So the next item was the board attorney evaluation. I would suggest that we not discuss that until uh, the other discussion has been had. Um, if in case some of these, um, some of the items around the job description change, then it would make sense to go back and look at this at that time. Is that okay? Yes, I think that's a great suggestion. Thank you for that. Okay, then there were um, some sample letters that were included. Um, they wanted to make sure that the information was up to date, but then the main question was, does the board currently send these letters? So when uh, there is a new appointment of a principal or an assistant principal, uh, the practice in the past was that the board would send a letter of congratulations and those samples were in here. But one of the questions was, do we currently, is, is this being done? And I don't know the answer to that. And I think it, that typically was done by the office staff. Mm -hmm. So, and I don't know the answer to that currently now, but that is something, uh, that is something that we need to look at and make sure that we do congratulate people when they uh, move up in the ranks. So, so I'm hearing that it is a practice you would like to see continued, so it should stay in protocol. Is that correct? I'm sorry. Yeah. You would like to see that practice continue. If it isn't being done, you, you believe it should be? Right, and let's pull the board. Does everyone agree that we should mm -hmm. congratulate people as they progress in the district? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. In that, in that case, we'll leave that in there and I can check the information to be sure that it is up to date. Thank you. Uh, the next item was expectations for the chair. And this is on page 68 in your manual. And it said that um, we need to add the board auditor to that under number six, where it says be responsible for promoting a cooperative team atmosphere among the superintendent, board members, board attorney. And you can, if you're looking at your copy, I added in red board auditor so that that was included as part of the team. So that one's been taken care of. The next item was um, a request to reword number seven, which currently says the chairman is the servant of the group, not the master. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so how would you like to see that reworded? I think that suggestion, whoever made it, is good. The chair works in conjunction with the board, not unilaterally. Board is there agreement for that? Much more professional. Yeah, yeah for yes. sure. <laughs> and I, uh, was probably you. Ms. Patrika. Great. Uh, Ms. Giovanelli. Okay. All right, thank, thank you. you. I, I may I make a quick comment because yes, I, um, yeah, I, <laughs> I really think we need to to look at that because it does depend on who the chair is. I was, when I was chair, I just have to put it out there. I was told quite a few times that um, I that I do not make you know decisions on my own, which I knew. And a lot of the things that I'm noticing now the chair does is different than what I was told that I was allowed to do. So yes, we need to look at that and say that it's not unilateral. And I, just, and I, and I think that's what we just agreed on, that it's you. not unilateral. And yes. And, and I, I just want to comment that I don't make any decisions on my own. Except uh, neither did person. I, but yeah. I was told quite often that I was doing that. So. Thank you. Okay. So we'll change that wording. The next piece was adding the protocol of answering emails to the board. And with your indulgence, I'll put that one off because the, uh, the whole piece around um, email was, was to be brought back. So when we finish this, we'll go back to that if we have time. If not, we'll, we'll bring that to a forward to another workshop. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Then the next piece was around the guidelines for maintaining a positive school board and superintendent relationship on page 70. And the first item there was number five, which under the superintendent says, distribute all appropriate information and data to all board members to assist with decision-making. 
and there was a um, suggestion to add in a timely manner to all board members equitably. We'll open that for discussion. Okay, board members. Ms. Gittins. My suggestion on that is, um, <clears throat> excuse me, many times we, the superintendent will say, well, I'll mention that one-on-one. -on -one. And when we have our one-on-ones, is it a possibility to have some agenda or something? I know we get it on our individual uh, superintendent thing, but something that just the topic, so that way at least we know that everyone is, uh, you know, not the details of it, but just that these are the superintendent's topics for one-on-ones this week. And that way we know, so if we don't get a discussion on that, we can ask about it. <clears throat> so Dr. Atkins, when you uh, do the one-on-ones, is your list of topics that are current for that week for the whole board, right? Right. But right, and, and um, you know, we take great care to make sure that every board member has every item. So, you know, it's, they, they look practically identical. Right. So look at like last week's, you know, one-on-ones is pretty much a pretty lengthy agenda. It's in, in your office manager. So you can go back and look at every one of the items that was discussed and. So everyone's office manager pretty much looks the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> okay. All right, then the second item was um, number 12, which currently says bring matters to the board in a timely fashion by presenting programs and projects far enough in advance so board members have time to study the information and provide input. Um, and then there was a question about uh, discussing how this relates to agenda item changes and deadlines. So we'll open that for discussion. Okay, board members, any comments on that agenda? Agenda item changes and deadlines. I, I think we've discussed that before, and I know I brought up before about having a, a, a deadline to get information. I know things happen, but people will not get in the habit of making sure they fulfill that deadline unless they miss it a couple of times. And I, I know there's things that they say, well, we have to get this through, but it just seems very often that we do get things at the last minute or changes to to the agenda and then we have to, you know, say, did I see that or did I not see that or and Well and, and I think maybe you're referring to things that come up as good of the order because it is no, not not so much that as agenda changes uh, or pulls or, you know, we we get the when something happens in board docs and we get the yes. immediate uh, and and we will get those up until a couple hours before the meeting. You want to address that, Dr. Atkins? I mean, you know, like what would prompt that? Because I know things happen, and especially this past and uh, yeah eight uh, months. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think that the if you look at the number of agenda items versus the numbers that number of times that happens, I think it's really minimal. I do, I can tell you that we have been, um, you know, we've had some some very you know, tough conversations with some of our department directors to make sure that they're making sure that they're getting the materials to their chief in an accurate manner, and the the expectation that chiefs has have is that they're holding those people accountable if they are, you know, making mistakes that have to be corrected uh, last minute like you may see. So we really, believe me, I, I, people, my staff knows that I hate to get good calls items and I hate to do changes as much as you hate receiving them. <laughs> and, it's and very, very just... frustrating. I think in a professional organization you want to, I, I stress it, you need to make sure that you're proofing your work it, you know, it should not land on your chief's <coughs> desk with inaccuracies, incorrect dates and things like that. And it certainly shouldn't land on a board member's desk that way as well. So, um, you know, I hear you, 
understand I do address it and we try to keep good causes to a minimum. And, and I know I know when I when I was chair and I worked with Jennifer how frustrating it was for you and your staff to to get that. And you know, I appreciate you <laughs> making the tough talks with them and saying that it trickles down when you make a mistake and everybody is affected by that. Mm -hmm. so. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Ms. McClough. And the next item was on the board oh, side. I'm sorry. Uh, Ms. Vaughn. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't notice this. What happened on the, um, oh, are you going over on the board side now? Yes. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I thought you were moving on because I was just going to ask what happened to number three. <laughs> the, the last one is on the board side, which says number 13 is too vague. It currently reads channel any substantial requests for information or action through the board to the superintendent and should reflect the desires of the board as a whole. Was that the one that you were asking about, Mrs. Vaughn? No, but go ahead and do that. Okay. And I'll come back. Okay. Okay, I'm sorry, but would, would you just read I'll that repeat one that. more time? Mm -hmm. um, on the board side, it says to channel any substantial requests for information or action through the board to the superintendent and should reflect the desires of the board as a whole. Yes, okay, board members comments on that or clarification? Am I the only one speaking up? <laughs> okay, Ms. Gittins. Um, <clears throat> the thing with that is sometimes there are things that are germane to a one board member that's not to everyone else. And it it's important that they, you know, would like to get that information and that if every question that we have that requires something, the board has to say yes or no, you can't get it. I don't think that that's equitable in that we are all, you know, public officials and if we would like to get some information, I, I it's difficult leaving the fact that I need a question answered or I need something done to bring it to the board for them to tell me yay or nay, can I get that information? So I think basically if it takes time and energy and hours of staff, uh, I and because we are a a, a team, a body, and that none of us has any uh, authority unique to ourselves, but we are to act as a group, a cohesive group, that that is, that it is kind of the rule is that the board, the majority of the board has to say that this is important in order for that information to happen. And what is the determination that if I ask for something, is it staff or the superintendent's office that decides this is gonna to take too much time, you need to take it to the board, or at what point does that happen? An estimate of the amount of time it's gonna take staff to track it down. If it takes more than an hour and a half, it comes before the board for a vote. It's in our protocols, is it not? Yeah, Miss. And, and, sorry. sorry, no, please, and, go ahead. And I, this is a little <coughs> counterintuitive to me given the comments made earlier about the superintendent sharing information equally with every board member. Um, this feels a little counterintuitive to me. That That's the first thing. The second thing is we don't act alone. Like if you need a data request out of um, to support your initiative and to move forward with the initiative and that's going to take more than an hour and a half, you come to the board, I'm all, all thumbs up. But if an individual board member is going down a rabbit hole that the rest of the board does not agree should be pursued, then, then that's where the, the, we make a decision as a body. So I'm very comfortable with the rule as it is. Okay, Ms. Giovanelli. I just would like to ask the um, board attorney, what is the law regarding um, that and getting information as an elected official and doing our job? In oversight. So the board does act as a collective body and it does, it's supposed to be able to move forward, you know, jointly, not individually. I think the rules that you have in place now with the one hour and a half in terms of time, depending on what the board's pleasure is, 
Um, that's up to you how you want to set that up. But in terms of actual getting additional information, things like that, the statute says that you act collectively, not individually. So that is what the statute says. Thank you. So, Ms. Gittins? Well, I, and I brought this up before, I did receive, I, I don't recall if it went before the board. I believe it did, but anyway, I was given, I guess, permission to get the information, but then was charged $72 in order to receive it, in order for them to do it. And I, I don't know where that decision came in. Is does Does it say if it takes over an hour and a half and there's a dollar amount and board members and everybody have to pay to get information? I'm gonna to defer to attorney Bruno, but I was not aware that as board <coughs> members with doing business of the board that we would be charged personally for uh, that. I think that was a conversation though. Is it, is it personal or is it the board? I think that's where that came well, into play. Anything that. that we're doing here that requires information from the district should be business of the board and, and for the district. Okay, I think that's and it was, was. no, it, it had to do with I wasn't asking, I don't have a child in the district asking for something. It, it had to do with board business, but I was told that um, I would have to pay $72 in order to get it. So I'm, I'm imagining that was through a public records request. That's the only way I could see that there be a bill. I know that this was something that we had talked about before, and this is part of you know this process of figuring out your protocols and your processes, how you want to handle this. The statute does not discuss, you know, when board members can request records, how much they can be charged for. The statute says that board members are entitled to have whatever documents that they need in order to do and conduct their business. The statute also says that board members are not individuals, they must act collectively. So this is why you have these processes to try to determine your internal controls and your internal processes, how you want to move forward with these types of distinctions. Thank you, Ms. Bruno. Board members, any other comments or? Yeah. Okay. okay, yes, Ms. Vaughn. Comments on that or the other things from this, this side? Okay, A anything that we are discussing this afternoon? Yes. Yeah. All right. Um, okay, so under school board, where, what happened to number three? There's a blank here. <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> okay. It's, uh, it looks like a, a copy and paste error, so I will go back and look for that. <laughs> All right. Um, the other one, and I, I didn't notice this or didn't think about it before, going down to number 14, um, avoid surprise items at board meetings. I'm wondering, and I hadn't really thought about the verbiage here, but that just sounds about. a little unprofessional surprise items, like um, like we're giving a surprise party or something. Um, maybe we can come up with, you know. We're lost. We're lost here. Uh, where, where are you? On board side, number. Page 71. 71. Yeah. I believe that came about, if, if memory serves, um, as um, a reminder that um, introducing new items at the board meeting, um, new actions were, the courtesy was to allow board members uh, at least 24 hours notice in advance. I believe that's right. where that came I, from. I don't have a problem with that. What I'm saying is um, if, if we look at the verbiage elsewhere, this doesn't quite rise to master servant, <laughs> but it's, it's a little, sounds a little unprofessional, just mm. surprise items. So, um, it, possibly I, go back I and look at the language. This, but look, does somebody have a suggestion for more professional language for that? Perhaps go back and look at the language that's in protocol around um, the the time limits on on introducing new items and, mm. and word it somewhere around that and bring that back to you. I, I can. I'm yes. just curious what my colleagues think about that. If surprise items 
doesn't kind of, it's just kind of. I still don't see where you're at. I don't see where you're at either. I don't see it is on page 71 and, and it is on the left hand the column under um, guidelines for maintaining a positive not, school board superintendent relationship. It's on the actual, actual it's protocol. It's on the protocol document. manual. Oh, it's in the manual? Okay. Yes. yes. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure. Yeah, it was it's something I didn't think about before, but as I was looking at the blank <clears throat> for number All three, that. I'm like, mm -hmm. I don't know about that language. It just sounds Page 71. unprofessional. <sighs> Maybe, Mr. Dupree, Bruno, what, how could we say something like that, keeping the the concept of this, but maybe making it a little more specific. What is a surprise? Yeah, here, okay, I have to page 67 and then it goes right to 77. And I believe you may be looking at the old manual, the one that was in the items today is the new one that was, I mean, it was in last week, but you may have pulled up the one we used before. Yeah, I'm looking at whatever was here. on today's board docs. Yes, she, it's on today's she's, board she's actually on page 69 of the manual. Yeah, which is the subsection H. Bottom of this. Which talks and about the avoid surprise them. items. And I believe that goes back to some of your um, protocols in terms of meetings and bringing things to the meetings so that everyone has an opportunity, pursuant to Robert's rules, everyone really should have an opportunity to be informed prior to um, having to take a vote on a particular motion. So I, I'm, I'm thinking that that's what this is about in reference. Right, right. And I think that, I mean, there's ways that we can clean the language up a little bit, if that's the concern. Yeah, probably because I'm just an English yeah. teacher. Is that but it unforeseen, just... abrupt? Okay. Unexpected, unforeseen, abrupt. I would like ambush, but that's a little strong. <laughs> I think those all say the same thing in a more professional way, no? But don't we have, um, where is it written then that talks the about having, um, what? like if we're going to do a good of the order or something that we have to do it, there's something that talks about 24 hours well, or... Whatever that, where is that connected to? That? That's not a written. That's not it's written not a in policy. policy. A it is not in policy. It's a and protocol. I know in in the past when I've brought up a surprise item, that there's <laughs> been problems, and and I un, I understand that, um, and I'm not contesting this. I'm just saying, I or I I mean I can live with it. But I just thought maybe a little more Down to page. specificity with what is a surprise item. I think, I think this is really referencing things that come up. Um, for example, if there is a, an issue that has come up board members may not be aware of and then you go to a briefing or an action meeting, really an action meeting, and it's brought in during good cause I'm sorry, good of the order for a motion on a particular issue that perhaps board members were not prepared for. Yes, I yes. think that's what this is referencing. Yes, yes. So we have to balance that with the fact that sometimes there are things that happen that are, you know, we can't prepare for. Something that happened that day, you do want to bring it up. So there's a balance there. That's it. So avoiding to bring matters that are not vetted prior to or provide board members with um, motions with as much advance notice as possible, something along something those lines. Like that. that sounds good. Okay. Sometimes it's not possible to give, you know. Ex exactly. There might be instances, but um, I mean, surprise items at the board, <laughs> the way it's written, if I brought brought cupcakes for everybody or something. <laughs> hey, look what I have for you. It's a surprise. You know, it just doesn't sound professional. 
I'll, I'll word something and bring it back okay, to you. you. When you get the next version, the changes will be in red, and then we'll ask for you know, acceptance and of those or changes of those. Or not. Yeah. Okay. okay, thank you. Well, moving on to um, the next item is the self-evaluation form for the board members. The suggestion is that um, perhaps the board self-evaluation item could be in the same format as the superintendent's evaluation to provide for more clarity. So we'll open that for comment. And that was me again. Board members? <laughs> that was me again. Ms. Ms. Gettin? Um, I don't know, I guess formatting and forms, it just to me makes it easier if the layout of the form is, employees all have an evaluation format form, so why can't we have one for the governance team that looks the same so that there's not as much confusion? And that's where I was talking to on the superintendents about having the one on his um, interim that gives very simplistic and it has a column, you can add comments or whatever. Why can't we use that each time? Because I, I, don't, I don't know how professional it looks for us to do an evaluation and then have a separate document that looks different from everyone if they choose to do it. Um, so that's why I'm asking. If you look at his interim evaluation, the form that's used, yes. that's what I'm talking about. Yes. Okay, board members, any comments, additions? Okay. So your suggestion is that we use the the format that we have currently for the interim evaluation with each evaluation. With each evaluation. Uh, and including the uh, governance team or the mm -hmm. board evaluation, self-evaluation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then I'm just looking for comments or input from other board members or the board attorney. Attorney Bruno. Thank you. I, I would like to go back just for clarification on page 16, subsection 7, which talks about the use and request for information in the data collection. Because I know that this has come up several times, I just want to make sure whether or not there is a charge or not a charge for the data collected, because this does not address it. And, and where, where is that located? That's on, that's on page 16, subsection 7. It talks about the time. I guess, I mean, it does say or require any expenditure of funds, but we, I think the board needs to flush that out a little bit for clarification and also for um, staff purposes as to what is chargeable, what is expenditure of funds, what is required. Um, Ms. Dupree Bruno, just, I got to just uh, receive a little information, you know, since the last time we had this discussion and it's our understanding that if, if somebody acts individually and submits a public information request to the public, to their document outside of this, that they would treat that as a normal public information request, but anything that comes through like our office or or that we discuss here would be but would be handled um, as per the protocols, which mean that if if somebody brought me a request for information and we evaluated that and it was uh, more than you know an hour and a half, then that's something that you know I'd get back with the board member and talk about you know taking that to the to the board, um, so that's the clarification of that that I received. If that helps, so then if we are following protocol and send our request to you in writing or hand it to you during our one in one, you can have staff evaluate whether it'll take more than an hour and a half time limit. 
And that, if it that, will, then the board member brings it to a workshop or a meeting and gets a majority approval. That's correct. And then there would be no charge because it really wouldn't be a public records request. Okay. <coughs> and so isn't that basically what we do? Okay. Can I ask um, the in this policy is the superintendent's interim evaluation instrument? I'm not seeing that. It's immediately following the regular superintendent's evaluation, I believe. Let me find it for you. That's what I was looking for. That was around 50. It's on page 51. Um, I can pull it up here for you. I, okay. <clears throat> and it, yeah, starting on page um, 50, in regards to this suggestion, you see how it says positive scenes or suggestions for growth. The way that that's laid out on page 50, you can see it on the screen, is what I'm talking about. And the purpose is there's some place to write comments. And if we compare that to the regular evaluation, the comment section is separate, right. where, where you exactly. have a space to write comments, but it's not directly, core, not, not beside the other. with the items. Okay. I mean, you know, um, I... Yes. So the point of, of the evaluation is the rubric, the use of the rubric, and you don't have that in the interim evaluation, so I would right. not be inclined to adopt the interim evaluation as the evaluation instrument in the annual evaluation. Right, no scoring and compilation, yeah. I'm sorry? No scoring and compilation in the right. interim, it's just a... Well, and I'm not saying replace the rubric and the scoring piece. I'm just saying, is there... Okay. Let me under, make sure I'm understanding. I my. My thought was that you were asking for a modification of the format with the rubric to include an additional column beside the rubric number where you could insert exactly. positives and, and yes. opportunities or, plus or deltas, basically, or something. comments. And it's not in the final rubric at all. And so, like I said, for the past two that I have done, I've created an Excel document because I, I wanted to be able to explain why I said what I did. And, and there is a comment section under each section of the rubric, right. and, and, most, and I, I believe most members do make use of that. It's just in a slightly different format. So if, if there's a desire for a format change, that's an easy change. It's whatever, whatever the board desires. Okay, board members. So it would be moving that comment section then to the right of the rubric where the um, highly effective, effective, et cetera, is. It would be adding one more column and taking away the comment section on the bottom of each page. Okay, yes. I, I personally Jordan. like the comment section on the bottom only because you can put the number down there and write long ways across. If you have a little square to write in, it's going to be more typical I know, for me to, to try to shove all that inside of a little box. That's my personal opinion. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Miss, Miss Vaughn. Yeah, that's, that's how I've done it. Just mark, you know, like it's 2.02 .02 and then it across. Okay. It, it's easier. We, we do have, or is it just an understanding or is it actually written somewhere? that any time we give, let's say, um, a five or a one or something like that, that we... That That's in the directions, yes. It's in the directions, yes, good, yes. okay. And, and that, I don't know that we always follow that, but I think that's an important Agreed. point, that the very top and the, and the bottom should... Have a rationale. Should have a rationale, yeah. Thank you. Any other board member comments? 
No. Okay. Then. Um, let's see. So I'm hearing there is not a desire to change the format. Is that correct? No. Okay. I, I don't. Not a consensus. Okay. Hey, the, um, the final item was actually added um, this yesterday. The board attorney uh, called and, and asked if we could add one item to discuss about the um, the use of resolutions at board meetings. Currently, um, there have been a couple of different methods with resolutions. For a while, uh, they were not read and. Then uh, we had students reading resolutions. Uh, sometimes groups would come forward if there was a resolution that pertained to a specific group. And so um, there is a need for guidance on how you would like to proceed when there are resolutions before the board at an action meeting. And I believe um, the board attorney has some recommendations around that. Okay. So the recommendation would be that for the resolutions that there being an acknowledgement versus reading the entire resolution. There was also a recommendation to avoid any issues with multiple groups that may be impacted by the resolution, that it's not specifically provided to a particular group. So those are some of the thought processes and we just need some board direction in terms of how you wanna handle the resolutions. For now, there won't be any groups coming into the boardroom because of COVID-19. So, but still, we, we need some guidance for after COVID-19 as well. Okay, board members, any comments? Or suggestions regarding resolutions? I'm, I'm not quite sure I'm clear on what this comment is asking. Are they saying we just acknowledge it by saying it's, you know, such and such month and that's all we say? It could be a little longer than that, but in lieu of reading the entire resolution, it would say, for example, um, this is Black History Month, you know, established in such and such time and we celebrate Black History, very, very simple, versus, you know, the complete reading of the entire resolution. I, I think I can, I can live with that part, um, but the issue of not having people here to represent, uh, I'm kind of <laughs> on the fence about that one. I think it's not necessarily not having people here, it's more so who will be receiving the resolution. So in lieu of actually presenting the resolution to a particular group, because some of these are very general, like Black History Month or Italian American Month or what have you, it's very, very general. So instead of actually pulling somebody in to receive it, any group can come, but not necessarily receive the actual resolution. Ms. Patrika. I, I mean, this came about as a result of um, discussions with the Hispanic vote in the Hispanic community last year. They were upset that we didn't read the entire resolution, but there was no desire to receive the resolution. It was a matter of acknowledging in detail the importance of Hispanic Heritage Month. And so I'm not clear on why we would cut back on the reading of the full resolution, and I'm also not really clear on why we have to give it to anybody. No. Like, What's broken about what we've been doing, I guess, is my question. Not necessarily that it's been broken. These are just things that we're bringing to the board so that we can flush it out a little bit. There's been um, some history where it's been read in the past, it hasn't been read in the past, so we just want some board direction so we know exactly how to move forward. So I guess my feedback would be what we've been doing for the past year has been working, I think. I mean, obviously, we don't have a student here so whoever's month it is reads the resolution until we have students back and then they, like if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And from my estimation, this is not broken right now, so. Great, thank you. Ms. Jordan? And with, when that took place, they were invited to come here because they felt that they were going to be receiving that their resolution. <clears throat> and so that's why a group came in. But when you look at the group that came in, do they represent all of the Hispanics? No, but a certain group was called to come in to receive that. 
that's where the uh, people were upset because they came for that purpose and then it wasn't done. See, I thought they, they I thought they were upset that that's exactly what happened. That the resolution wasn't read. I thought that was right. that was the conversation that right. I had. It was not. It wasn't read, but right. they thought that they were here to accept it. And that's where you you have to be careful because do they represent the broader spectrum? I mean, I'm Italian. Do I come and I represent every Italian here? Right. We, right. we have to be very careful with that. Too, we'll give you the resolution. Thank you. I will collect it. <laughs> but I'm saying you have to be very cautious of that. So, and and typically there are representatives of groups when they know we're going when you know the resolution is in the agenda. So. Um, I agree with you. It, reading the resolution has um, been acceptable to many of the groups, and I think we should continue to read the resolution. I, I mean, like, there's nothing wrong with a picture after the board meeting with a group of people right. that came for that purpose. Right. You know? Okay, Ms. Gittins. Just a thought, since we're student driven, what if? we're representing all the different nationalities of students that we have. So why couldn't we have a student to be the recipient for, you know, just district-wide? Not giving it to them individually, but, you know, maybe it's posted somewhere, but a representative of, you know, that group. And so, like, if it's Hispanic, then you might have you know, more than one student, a Cuban student, a Puerto Rican student, a whatever, uh, here to represent uh, receiving that for their particular group. Yes, Ms. Ms. Vaughn. Why does a group have to receive it? Because, for instance, Hispanic, there are huge differences among the Hispanic groups just in Lee County. And it's the same with the blacks and, and all of the other um, recognitions that, that we do. Um, I, I would say, to kind of get it out there, that if somebody, an individual, wants to, like a head of the NAACP comes in during Black History Month and chooses to do a three minute Thank you to the board. I'm glad you recognized it. We're doing this, that, and the other, or you know, Black History Society, or something like that. But you know, if we choose a particular group to receive, that's just going to cause problems because we and, have so many groups. Right. And I think that's the, what Attorney that's Bruno what is saying. saying. Yeah, yeah. To receive. The other thing that I would like to see is a list of the, um, the various proclamations that we do. You know, there's some huge areas um, of, you know, such and such month, such and such week or, or whatever, you know, but um, I think we also have to be really <coughs> careful and, and we need to be looking at our population here at, um, for instance, you know, I'm on the Haitian American board. I don't think we had a a recognition that it's a Haitian Heritage Month and, and, and it's huge to that segment of the population. So um, I, I really would like to see, do we have an existing list of every year we recognize it's... We, we do, Ms. Vaughn. We do have a list that has pretty much um, a comprehensive list. I don't know if Haitian uh, American Month is on there, but I know that it's very comprehensive in that we have worked with the Diversity and Inclusion <coughs> Office, Mr. Eady, to make sure that we are as comprehensive as possible. So we can give you um, just a list of all those different things, but we do have them. But we also do, in the past, we've done <coughs> weeks Right, mm -hmm. it's such and such like mental health week or yes. the one that always, I always laughed at for high school teachers was um, sleep week. 
whatever it's called, the get enough sleep week or something like that. I always found that very ironic, but um, smoking week. We yes. have those as well. We have the mental health month, the nurses week, the bus driver week. We have all of those as well. I, I know we do, but we <coughs> can maybe we evaluate what we have because we really don't know what's coming up until it appears. I mean, um, Ms. Fisher, do you get a list like I don't get a list, but um, I, I know that um, our diversity department has a list and our board secretaries, to my knowledge, had a list because they would prepare the resolutions and the proclamations. Right, right, right. But right. not all of them have to do with diversity. Some of it's... Not all of them have to do with diversity, right. Other issues like the mental health. And yeah. Right. And for instance, next month comes up Red Ribbon Month, so, and then we have a... Uh, the coalition does typically have an event here in the boardroom uh, in, on the evening. So, and that's separate from board meeting, but yeah. So, um, and Ms. Patrika and then Ms. Giovanelli have comments, and then I'll turn it back over to, Doc, to Attorney Bruno. So when we first discussed doing this, we had agreed that Mr. Eady would determine which ones were read out loud on a monthly basis. Um, we do have stuff occurring every week, but, but we were relying on his expertise and his contacts in the community to determine um, which proclamations or resolutions or whatever we call them were um, most reflective of the population of our student body. And I feel comfortable continuing to rely on Mr. Eady for that guidance and having those items placed on our agenda in accordance with his guidance. And, 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 I, and I do agree with, I do agree with that. And Ms. Giovanelli? My only actually question is, should EDAC be involved in that determination, which he is on that, um, you know, he guides it. But I mean, EDAC is supposed to be the diversity and I think we, I agree with Ms. Bruno right, that- but this I, goes beyond, I mean, we have other organizations like exactly. the Drug Free like, Coalition, that's not a diversity issue, right. but it's important to the community. But that's why I agree with her that we need to make that decision. Well, I, I will just clarify that the list that we have actually has been thoroughly vetted by Mr. Eady and those okay. in his office. So those are the ones that he has determined are, are the ones that we really do need to recognize. Okay. okay. Good to know. And so then maybe the board can uh, look at the list and um, that's approve it. <laughs> yes, Ms. Vaughn. That's, that's all I'm ask, asking for because um, I, I really don't think Haitian Heritage um, Month, I, I don't think it was recognized last year. I can't remember it being recognized. And um, they're our second largest um, ESOL group. And, and so, you know, there may be things, I'm, I'm not trying to undermine what Mr. Eady does, he does a great job, but um, we all have our contacts within the community and I, I think mm -hmm. some of it just needs to be, you know, I'm not asking National Spaghetti Day or something, I'm just... <laughs> <laughs> It's important. Ice cream but week I, or something is very important. He's gonna say food. Right? So, in terms of protocol, what I what I believe I'm hearing in terms of protocol is that the um, the practice that's been in place for the past year of reading the proclamation or the resolution will continue. There um, will not be specific groups invited. There's nothing that is actually being handed to anyone. And then, uh, aside from protocol, the board would like to see a list of of groups and days and topics, maybe is a better word, topics that will be on the resolution list. Is that correct? That, that's my understanding to this point, Ms. And, Jordan. And why can we not, um, because we do want to include the students, why can we not have them, even though they're not necessarily here, just like we're doing with uh, people coming and doing the invocation, perhaps participate in that manner so they're, they feel like they're engaged with the students? Okay, and, and I think, you know, that would just mean uh, someone at the school, you know, choosing the student and either videotaping or... Because do we not have their advisory? Do we still not have the student advisory? Well, we, 
That's another thing I was going to bring up tomorrow, but yeah, okay. Um, we do still have the student advisory, but we have not reactivated because we have children doing virtual and you know face to face, and so we have not been able to uh, come together with that. And then, frankly, without Susan, uh, it's been a challenge. Okay, so. So, um, so, Attorney Bruno, do you have some final comments or? So one of the issues with the, the students that at this point, because of social distancing, we don't have any space to put them on the dais. So that was one thing. I think that once we are alleviated from the COVID-19, then we can look into a process to see if it's feasible to have students represent the group. So right. I can and bring that back to this committee to right. discuss. And I think Ms. Jordan was suggesting that maybe they do a video tape or a, a call so, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that may be a possibility. We'll have to look into it. I can tell you that right now that we're evaluating how we can do our recognitions that include students because we want to make sure that we have parental consent and we have all of those things on file. So it does add an extra legal layer for us to go through, but we'll look into that. Thank you. Okay. All right. Ms. McClung. All right. Thank you. We do have one last item that we needed to go back from last time, uh, and this was looking at the policy for correspondence. So that is on page six. And if we start with the email, it currently says all email or mail received in the board office is forwarded to each of the seven board members. Email or mail with concerns related to the operation of the district will be forwarded to the superintendent's office and any correspondence related to board policy will be addressed as detailed below. And then if, if the uh, subject of the correspondence addresses issues which pertain to the purview of the school board, the board chair or the board office manager using the board chair's email account is responsible for the response. A copy of the chair's response will be shared with each board member. One copy is filed in the board office in the appropriate file, and each board member may also respond. However, since the request has been answered by the board chair, responses from individual board members are unnecessary. So there was some discussion at the last meeting around this, and there was no general consensus as to whether you wanted to continue this policy or this protocol. Okay, board members. So I, I'm not sure which portion the, that you're talking about. Is she talking about the, the, the responses? The mail or the whole page? That whole yellow? And, 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 okay. All the yellow. Okay. Yes. Well, I, I will say that on the standard email reply, um, I believe we all use it with caveat that normally I will say something else as well, not just give them that. That's just me because um, people hate to feel like they're just receiving a, a blanket, you know, stamp. So. I just normally say something, you know, to them personal and then say the part about the superintendent. Right. Well, well and, and I think there were a couple of issues. One was that sometimes you can't tell if it went to anyone else. Right. So, I mean, I think that people, when you know it's from someone in your district, you respond. Um, at this point, when we had the whole COVID thing, uh, we had... Um, the uh, board reopening email, so we forwarded a lot to that. Um, I, I try to answer those I can if Latanya doesn't get to it before I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, uh, I, 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 I'd like to hear input from other board members about that. And then Ms. Patrika was kind enough to volunteer to answer the graduation emails because she was kind of directly involved in that and I really appreciated that. 
um, Ms. Jordan. I, I think if it has my name on it, personally my name on it, I will respond to that okay. because it does have my name on mm -hmm. it. So I want to make sure that they understand that I, I hear what you're saying. Thank you very much. And if it needs to go further, then I send it to the <coughs> so that way they have the information. Uh, and I, I do see, and I do appreciate a lot of times when there are maybe three or four uh, names on an email that it is forwarded to all of us because then we're, that allows us to be engaged and to mm -hmm. understand when it comes before, when a question comes before um, all of us, then we have that information and that background because we have uh, been given that uh, information. So I do appreciate that as well. So, um, Attorney Bruno, is there, are there policy implications with correspondence? Repeat what you said, Madam Chair, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, is there a policy implication with correspondence? No, it's pretty much just addressed in your um, protocols and your processes. Okay, so, I mean, I think it's good business to respond to the public when they email us for certain. and. I mean, I'm comfortable with board members when it's an issue that they're familiar with or they get to it first and their name is on it and maybe they can't tell others, just as long as we are all copied so we realize that it's been responded to. So the only, the only caveat that I would put out there is that remember, the board acts as a whole and not individually. Right. So whenever you are sending an email out, we need to be very careful with the choice of words and the language so it does not appear that this is a unilateral decision that is being made by one board member. Right, and, and I mean, I think the common uh, to respond to send it to the superintendent and staff for specific answers is good and copying the board members allows us all to know that it has been responded to. And, and another suggestion, Ms. Gittins? Well, the question is, and I recall what we were talking about before, someone can send, some people will send to the board and each of our names will show up there. Other people will send it to the board, sending it to you and you and you and you individually and hit it seven times. Like copy. Okay? So I get an email that says Gwinnetta Gittins from, you know, Jane Doe. I don't know whether Jane Doe has sent it to the superintendent already or exactly. to all of you or what. So that's the, the technical piece that, that makes it a question because then... I'm thinking Jane Doe only sent it to me. So I respond to Jane Doe and I say that I will send it to the superintendent. Now the superintendent's getting, you know, she does that to everybody. He's getting Sometimes. seven copies saying, we're gonna send it to the superintendent. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know how to resolve that, but. Um, under, current uh, under current protocol, that would be resolved by forwarding it to the board chair who would then send it either to the superintendent or would reply to it. And that, that's what policy is currently, that if it, if it has purview of the district business, then it would be forwarded to the board chair for a response and everyone would be copied on it. You could also choose that each individual member responds and copies everyone and you would see if someone else had already responded to it. So basically the decision is, do you want to respond, bless you, individually, or do you want to forward to the board chair for a group response? No, I mean, I, if. So I don't, I mean, maybe that's something we need to discuss a little further because should it go to, then to the board office, and, and I think we have a, a it's board superintendent, um, the secretaries, that, that kind of centralizes it. But that's a different one. It can go to board office, or it can go to all of us on one email, right. or it can go to each of us individually right. on an so email. So maybe that needs to be streamlined. And I'll tell you that the number of, well, I don't have to tell you, but the number of emails is uh, a lot more than it used to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. But I, oh, I'm sorry. Bon. Okay, so if it goes to board office, That's I think we've, the, um, the secretary, in, in this case, LaTanya, is 
copying all of us. And so at that point, if we wish to um, give an individual response, we can say something like, you know, I see that this has already been forwarded to Dr. Atkins, but I just wanted to add or, you know, some, mm -hmm. something like that. I think if it comes like individually, um, you know, we can, whoever answers first, if we copy everyone, yes. um, unless we have something specific we want to add that we will have already known so that maybe the superintendent's office doesn't get seven, maybe only two or three, something, something like that. But to me, if it comes to the whole board, what we were talking about was, you know, sometimes I don't, unless it's an issue that's really close to my heart, I don't answer it. If it's, you know, something that we were getting a lot on the same topic and I figure, okay, well, the board chair is going to answer it. Now, when we had the graduation things, when we had um, opening or not the schools and when it's, you know, a whole lot of responses. Um, when we had our last discussion, we talked about rather than somebody just volunteering to do it, that the, um, vice, chair. the vice chair take over some of the, those duties. Um, mm -hmm. I, I just think to relegate that to somebody who says, well, I'll do it. Um, uh, you know, I, I think right. it's... Well, I mean, I, I, my thought is that there should be a way to be able to centralize it. Like for people who want to email us that it would all go... You know, we, we have too many options right now. And then, of course, they can email us each individually, and that does happen. Mm -hmm. When we respond, if that happens, we just send it, send the response, copy the superintendent's office and all the board members so that everyone is aware that it's been responded to. Yes. Um, I, I still think that, and, and I think I brought it up before, about having the, instead of saying the board chair, the board chair, the board chair, why not have the vice chair right. to have the responsibility for dealing with that if, if we decide that's the way it's going to go, to do... Mm -hmm. You know, we get something, it goes to the vice chair to make sure that everybody has it, as opposed to just having the chair, you know, do all of that. Because it, it, it has increased, and there are a lot of, um, a lot more emails. So that would be my suggestion. That's what I suggested before that, uh, on, and I don't think there's any way we can stop people from you know, doing the individual ones if they want to, it's just oh, going no. to and come. It, right. And so it's just a matter to. then, then the process would be, if it comes to board office, then the secretary and the chair know about it. If it comes to us individually, we would answer and then share it with the vice chair so that we know, I mean, everybody knows that it's been answered by at least one person. Mm -hmm. I, and I think every one of them has to be copied to the entire board along with the superintendent's office. Because mm -hmm. typically it's staff who have to respond with most of the situations. Madam Chair, Madam Chair, in, um, I'm noticing it is after 4 p.m. I wonder if um, the board might want to include this discussion in the communication protocol that we're going to discuss next month. Uh, since since the email or since all the correspondence is part of communication that would give board members time to think about how they might best like to approach it i think that's a great idea and so we'll do that then on the 19th of october thank you and with that we've those were all the items that were on our protocol list thank you thank you very much and we appreciate you each and every time you've been extremely patient and efficient and we couldn't do it without you. Well, thank you, it's my pleasure to help. At this time then, any uh, comments for good of the order, Ms. Giovanelli? None, thank you. No, thank you. Okay, Ms. Jordan. Um, I can't remember, so no, thank you. <laughs> okay, Ms. Gittins. Yes, I, um, 
a couple of other things I'll, I'll bring up tomorrow, but I do want to mention that I think it was back last summer, I was speaking with some administrators and some teachers out in the East Zone, and we were talking about um, conversations about race, and we were talking about that. So one of the um, one of the teachers at, uh, I think she's an assistant administrator at uh, Harns Marsh, uh, talked with, in, let's see, in, um, uh, what's her name? Uh, in Grants, I just lost her name. Kenzie, Ms. Kenzie, about, um, that we were thinking about doing a book study. And, uh, Ms. Kinsey had told her about one that she had done in uh, during getting her degree. And it was this one, which is Courageous Conversations About Race. So we talked about it. They decided, well, let's do that one. And invitations were sent to um, administrators, community people, parents um, in the East Zone. And it was to be a just a, a, a pilot to see, have the have go through a book study. We have I think seven, eight weeks tonight is the first one, and we will be discussing courageous conversations about race. At the end of each chapter, there are some questions. So the basic outline is that people will read um, the uh, chapters, and then we'll discuss it. We start. We we will be doing it Zoom until later on. We'll decide to do something else, and it is basically because, as as one of the uh, uh, one administrator out there that we were talking to about it, and their comment was, "I'm not black, and I do not pretend to understand what other black students, parents, or other minorities are um, their perceptions." of our school and about education. And this book study is important for not only administrators, but educators like me to understand how to better understand minority students and how to properly emphasize with our kids and parents the changes that we would need to make. So that is the purpose of it. Um, it is after hours, it's not I've spoken to um, uh, Dr. Atkins knows about it, and also um, uh, Jared Eady. I spoke with him last Friday about it. So it's not something that's a, a secret. It was just a chosen group in the community to first do this and then to see where we go from there. Um, as we all know, we've talked about how this is the time that this conversation cannot just go unspoken and so that was why we decided to do this um, I understand that some board members thinks that it think that may think it's much more invasive than it is it's basically a book study this group of people are reading a book we're having a discussion about it for an hour on Mondays for eight weeks that's that's it right Thank you. I'll tell the rest tomorrow. Thank you. And Ms. Jordan, I'm going to back sorry, up to I you. I, yeah, I couldn't find the paper. But just real quick, um, we had a finance committee meeting this um, past week. And lo and behold, there, there are four of them who, five, that are um, auditors. So we were speaking about RSM. Two of them actually have worked for that company, uh, and they actually put into motion that they want to be involved and more engaged in what is taking place because they said that the templates that we are receiving are just generic based and they can look at them and give us the right questions because we may not be asking the right questions where they can actually help us and assist us. And I said, well, where have you been? So they are willing to assist us in uh, coming up with the questions that we may want to be asking the um, RSM, and they're willing to help. 
but these are people that have knowledge of it, and as I, as I said, two of them actually have worked with this company. So they're very willing to assist us. So then how will they prov provide us with those questions in their quarterly updates or? Um, however, we need to use, I mean, they want us to reach out to them. They want to be more engaged uh, with that. Uh, and they understand that it's not all um, financial but they have all done this before. Well, five of them have. Great. So I thought that was really good. And I know that they spoke to uh, Ms. Uh, Lecter. Kelly was there, so she's definitely aware of it. Good. So I just have one other question then, and it went right through my mind, so I'll think of it again. Okay. Ms. Vaughn. Thank you. Thank you. Whenever you have two members of an advisory, talking together to staff, that's a violation of Sunshine. Is it not, Ms. Bruno, don't they? You can't, I don't think you can do it that way. I, I'm, I'm not opposed to what you're saying about them helping us out, but doesn't it all need to be um, a complete finance discussion? So I think we really need to be careful with, with Sunshine. So the requirements are that the notice be, that it be publicized so that the community and the public knows about it, that it be open to the public, that minutes be taken. Those are the requirements. You can have two board members, you can have seven board members, you can have three board members, so long as we follow those rules. You notice it, it's open to the public, and minutes are taken. And it, it was during our committee meeting that this conversation was, so everybody was there, yeah. so it was open. But, I mean, they can that, that was fine, but what I worried about when you were describing it is, you said, oh, they can meet, who, who did you say? No, 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 Ms. I said that they are willing to assist us on... Um, you mentioned a staff member. Questions. Could, no, she or, was there because she's the uh, Oh, okay, the I'm sorry, I misunderstood. Okay, so, but I just wanted to pull that in that although I think it's a great, a great thing that um, we just really have to be careful that it's all open because, um, you know, we, we don't know. These must, might be wonderful people that are giving us straight great information or they may be somebody that well, disgruntled <laughs> former employee or, no. or whatever. I'm, I'm just putting it out there that we and I, and I yes and I was really the same, but I do what I I'm sorry may I yes please yeah, I'm, go ahead. I'm, I'm done what I was looking at it is they obviously know more than I know about the situation because I've never done an audit nor do I really know what questions I should be asking RSM to look for us so if we have people who are experts at this I think we need to utilize because that's why we have these committees right. and that we need to utilize the people that we have on there because they are the experts. And I, I agree with that, but I'm just the caveat. No, I, I of, Yeah. Okay, well, thank you. I'm sure you'll keep us posted as we move along. And then Ms. Vaughn, did you have any? I think Ms. Bruno wanted to add something. Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Bruno. So on October 5th, we have a workshop that is scheduled with RSM and it's gonna, I believe it's like three hour workshop that the board will be able to um, ask questions and discuss things. I know that Ms. Letcher, if Ms. Letcher was at the board advisory committee, that's a good thing because then she'll have some of that information and we can continue with our um, discussions with RSM. And in addition to that, we are trying to do the audit committee so this would also be a good opportunity for those individuals to participate in the audit committee and lend their knowledge in that aspect. So I, I think that's probably a very good combination. Thank you. No, I, I don't have anything. Okay. Mrs. Morgan, are you with us? I am with you. Uh, Mrs. Morgan, you're breaking up. She said she would save her comments. Oh, okay. I don't know until late our time, but she, I heard I will save my comments. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. Okay, and I have nothing for good of the um, good of the order. Um, Attorney Bruno, any further? 
Um, I have nothing. Okay, and, and Dr. Atkins. I have nothing, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you very much. And seeing no other business, come before this board and hearing no objections, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you again, Mrs. McClung. Thank you, Deputy.